Great. Good morning. This is Giant Justice Oversight Committee, and uh, we're meeting this morning. Uh, our first item on the agenda is an update on Department of Corrections Justice Reinvestment Two. Our first witness is Mary Jane Ainsworth, the Director of the Parole Board. Um, so, Mary Jane, if you could kick it off, um, give us an update on where we're at, <clears throat> and then we'll hear from Jim Baker. Good morning, committee. Thank you. Um, this is Mary Jane Ainsworth, Executive Director of the Parole Board. I'd like to thank you for allowing me the opportunity to go first as I am double booked this morning. Um, the Parole Board is currently working on updates to our policies and procedures um, to incorporate the changes established in Act 148, specifically around parole eligibility. There was a change to the initial eligibility um, uh, the presumptive parole section and also a slight change to the subsequent reviews and interviews. Um, we have increased our board member staff meetings to monthly since the pandemic because we have um, now have the opportunity to do these meetings virtually. Um, this allows Chairman George and I to discuss the changes with the board members more regularly, provide progress updates and seek inputs from members. Um, we are meeting regularly with DOC and the Council of State Governments regarding the implementation of the parole aspects of the Act and to discuss cross-training opportunities as changes um, to DOC policies, um, as the changes to DOC policies occur in regards to supervision of parolees and responding to offender behaviors. Um, this also gives us the opportunity to make sure that we are all working together to ensure that these changes go as seamless as possible. Um, DOC has also invited me to their weekly parole working group meetings. These meetings provide opportunities again for us to collaborate together. In addition to the above, the parole board is regularly meeting with the Council of State Governments to talk about policy review and feedback. They are providing assistance around best practice and assisting us with finding more evidence-based training opportunities for board members. This will assist the board to adapt with a shift away from furlough. Um, Council of State Governments has also included the parole board in the behavioral health working group as it's evident to CSG members um, after observing our hearings that the individuals being brought before the board, mostly with violations have significant behavioral health issues. Um, and also we've been, they started to examine our data with us so we can ensure that we're collecting um, the appropriate data to meet the CSG um, technical assistant grant. So that's really the bulk of what, where we are at and we are making headway every day and we will be ready to implement these changes when they go live on January 1st. Are there any questions for Mary Jane? Why don't I start off, Mary Jane, with a question regarding the mental health issues. They've been consistently problematic <clears throat> throughout our uh, you know, system. And um, what are we, um, and Jim, you can chime in as well. Uh, how are we moving forward on this? It's a national problem as well as a state. I agree. It is a it's it's significant issue. Um, many of the offenders that come back have the significant mental health issues, and being in a pandemic, it's been a little bit harder um, because a lot of the meetings are done virtually. But it feels as though the board is really struggling, especially responding to these behaviors um, of what do they do with the offender? Because incarceration doesn't seem to be the place for them to go, but there's no treat, there doesn't seem to be viable treatment options or residential options out in the communities. And I know Commissioner Baker has stated this many times, I've heard him speak about it, that it just, there's a community struggle and lack of resources. And it's some, some areas are much better than others, for sure. You mean geographically? Yes. Where, can you um, 
at our next meeting, maybe if we could devote Peggy a significant amount of time and ask the Justice Center to join us on this particular problem. And Mary Jane, if you could uh, let us know what areas of the state where we're lacking uh, adequate help. Um, I know we're deficient everywhere, but mm -hmm. are there particularly glowing problem areas? And um, I, I, I think it's, I, I don't know if I have a bill, but it should be, I think it's a part of justice reinvestment too, is that we struggle with this problem. So I would like to devote some of our time and maybe have um, some of the officers who, Jim, if you could help us with some of the field staff who are dealing with this. It would I would love to hear from some of them and the struggle they're having. And even if you'd like Mary Jane, a, a role, um, a parole board member who um, might be able to talk about that, or Mr. George. But I'd really like to devote some time to understanding the scope of the problem that some folks are facing. Uh, Senator Lyons, um, as chair of the Senate Health and Welfare Committee, is always interested in this issue. Uh, very much so, and I'm really glad that you brought it up. I, I guess as we're looking at this, it might be helpful to have the broaden the context and to look at where things stand with the um, contracted health services as far as mental health goes. And then I know that we had a report on uh, better integration of healthcare services within the community. And I don't know whether that report, I remember getting the report. I know we have it. I, uh, it's not fresh in my mind, but it would be helpful to know what came of that out of that. And we've, we've also looked in health and welfare. We've taken some time to ask for where the needs are in the community. So by geographic uh, area, so uh, Sarah Squirrel may be helpful as well as some of the um, Washington County Mental Health or Howard Center or some of the other folks who uh, have been collecting that data. So our community services. I'm, I'm, I guess, Senator Sears, I, I guess I'm asking, can we or should we expand this conversation at this time and, and open it up to the broader um, sort of the health care. I think at this point, I'd really like to focus, and I'm obviously whatever the committee wants to do, but I'd really like to focus this on those that are being reincarcerated, who are either on parole, furlough, or probation, um, because that was the focus, one of the main focus areas of Justice for Investment too, is to reduce the number of people that are reincarcerated. And when Mary... And, and the numbers who are exhibiting mental health issues and get reincarcerated, it's not solving their problems. So I, I would kind of like to focus on that, but if the committee want to go, wants to go deeper into it, I'm happy to do that as well. I, I don't know. I, I think that sounds uh, really uh, good. I, having uh, a look, see at case management issues and how folks are handled when they leave corrections and then how they're followed in the community uh, so that they don't re-enter and what happens if they do, so. Yeah, I mean, if the services aren't available, then that <laughs> becomes problematic. And I know that that's been true. And, and as the Department of Public Safety moves to embed officers into barracks, are we gonna run into this problem geographically as well? So, anyway. I know you've double booked, Mary Jane. I don't want to keep you, but if, I would, uh, if you can work with Peggy on, on some of those uh, to help us understand that. Though I'm, I'm particularly like to focus, if, unless the committee wants to go broader, on those that are being reincarcerated who are on furlough, probation, or um, well, well, who never get to you because of it. And from Jim's perspective, those that never get to you because their underlying mental health issues are not resolved. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Mary Jane and the parole board? 
thanks very much. Enjoy your next booking. Happy holidays to you. You too. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Baker, interim Commissioner Baker. We still use that term. <laughs> I, I, I do, Senator, with uh, great glee. So uh, nationwide, you know, most corrections. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioners don't last as long as you yeah, have as an yeah, interim. I, I, I don't know what that says about me, Senator, but uh, by the way of introduction, uh, this is Jim Baker, the interim commissioner of the Vermont Department of Corrections. Senator, just let me uh, let me make two comments about um, the conversation that was just going on. We will make line staff available for the next committee hearing. I, I think it's it's. Uh, incredibly important that you hear from some of the folks in the field. Um, I, I believe tomorrow's the day for the next working group yep. meeting for reinvestment um, in a conversation with the staff from CSG on Friday. I think you're going to see a slide in the slide deck tomorrow that is pretty compelling about the statement you just made about focusing on um, folks um, going back in, into facilities um, that have underlying mental health and or substance abuse problems. And, and, and to, to reveal all my sources, Jim, I had access to that. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure you did, Senator. This so, week. Um, yeah. So you saw the same slide that I saw that yeah. I have the yeah. advance notice of. And, you know, and again, what I'm about to say is not a reflection, nor do I want to call out um, services, but I'm going to say the same thing I've been saying for a number of months. And, and I think Monica and Dal will touch on this shortly. Um, we are very concerned about the level of services throughout the state when it comes to dealing with the population that we deal with. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a struggle. You know, uh, the mental health services are a struggle, um, especially in this environment with the pandemic. Um, but it's especially uh, a struggle to get the services we need to support the type of population that we're supervising. Co-occurring problems, mental health, substance abuse, uh, criminal thinking, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dangerous combination that's very difficult to find those services. And Monica and Dale will talk a little bit more about that in a, in a couple minutes. The other thing, Senator, I, I, that, that, I'll, that I've talked um, quite a bit inside corrections about, and I'll just plant the seed because you brought up the point about the collaboration between uh, Commissioner Sherling and Commissioner Squirrel in embedding um, the, uh, the caseworkers inside the barracks around the state. Um, as you know from, from visiting uh, Project Vision, that's a model that was, in, that was embedded in the police department at, at Rowling. And I've talked with staff a little bit about what would that look like if we embedded that type of uh, services inside our district offices to better help the probation and pro officers manage case with that. And I, I don't know, it's one thing to say it, it's another thing to think through what the potential impact would be. I do know that even if you had those type of services inside the district offices, um, if there isn't carry forward services to support the workers inside the district offices, I don't know what the outcomes would be, but it's clearly a challenge for us. Um, I'm just going to make a couple other more, couple more comments, and then um, this has been a very heavy lift, and I have to, I, ha I have to recognize, particularly Monica for the work that she's been doing leading this effort. Um, there, there's three to four meetings per week with different business groups within the model that they've been working on this, and um, every other week there's a, a briefing on Friday afternoon from all the groups that I try to attend. And the depth of the work here has been unbelievable, especially with um, the backdrop of the pandemic. Um, that takes a, a lot of our resources every day to manage the pandemic. And uh, I, I've got to call out Dale Crook and Monica Weaver for the work that they're doing. The other thing, Senator, you and I talked last week, um, you know, I think when we measure the progress of reinvestment too, um, you know, there's a lot of um, um, backlash from victims. Um, spending, uh, I've, I've had conversations with victims' families that felt like um, they didn't see this coming on the good time. So I, I, I have to put that out there because I promised those families I would. You and I spoke um, on, on Friday, I believe, last week about this. 
And uh, I continue to talk with, in particular, uh, the Winterbottom family who lost their daughter in 2004 to a vicious homicide in Burlington. So Representative uh, Emmons and I will also be on the agenda for the next meeting as um, a discussion of this with you and yeah. the department, as well as with uh, the Attorney General, uh, state attorneys, and uh, victims groups, the network, and the others. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, it's the uh, good time being um, afforded to offenders who've committed extremely serious crimes or have been convicted of extremely serious crimes and they're, um, the victims are um, received a mass blast email from the department informing them of this and there have been some pushback. But we, uh, there, there is no bill right now, but it's something that will have to be dealt with um, moving. And again, Senator, I bring it up out of respect to the victims. Right. Representative Shaw. I promise him I would. Uh, thank you, Senator. A question for Jim, uh, for Commissioner Baker, maybe more of a comment. I, too, like you and I'm sure others of us have had some pushback on the uh, on the good time piece from uh, folks that uh, were victims of uh, previously sentenced uh, uh, inmates, and they're having some a struggle with that. But one that clearly uh, caught my attention was uh, the gal uh, told me that when she talked to the victim's advocate uh, within DOC, uh, the, the advocate, the, uh, the, the person she talked to gave her, unknown to my caller, gave her some incorrect uh, uh, calculations based on on the available good time for the uh, for the incarcerated person, uh, and actually, after I thought about it for a while, that that person started calculating uh, the release date uh, of the offender uh, based on starting in January 1, 2021, when clearly that offender's good time wasn't going to start until uh, 23, uh, and it made a big difference because the the offender's release date was is 25. Uh, so, uh, is, can, can you comment on that? Or are people confused about well, the two? Maybe terms? if you could get specific on that, Representative Shaw, we could, uh, when we take this up next, next week, is it next week, December 2nd? Um, yes. Yeah. Again, it's Representative Shaw. It's hard for me to not knowing what the case is, right. um, but, but in a general comment, you know, um, like anything that's as complicated as calculating good time, it sounds like it's simple. Um, I don't think we're there yet in educating the staff and fully understanding what uh, the calculation is, because that's part of what the working groups continue to work on. So, Monica, do you have a comment? Did I see your hand, Monica? Yeah, I just i I wanted to make sure I understood Representative Shaw correctly. Um, I think I heard you say that good time, you didn't think good time was gonna start until 2023, when in fact, um, good time will start January 1st of 2021, and people will be able to start earning their good time and it will be applied to them beginning in February of 2021. So my 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 thinking is clouded, uh, Monica, and thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I would, had that confused with presumptive, presumptive parole, I think. Right. And that, right. The presumptive parole in 2023 expand, you know, expands to people who have committed. Um, I'll, I'll have more but, detail. I'll have more okay. detail if I request the senator for the next meeting. Right. So uh, in, in respect of time, um, those are just my opening comments, Senator, and uh, I'll, I'll give my time to Monica and Dal. Um, they, they do have in the document they gave you uh, a chart that kind of lists what some of our concerns are as we sit here right now. So I'm going to, I'm going to turn over my time now to them. By the way, I, I see Matt Valerio in the audience here and I'm, uh, he will definitely be part of the discussion next, next week. So there's no more questions for me, Senator. I'll turn it over to Monica and Dale. Monica or Dale or both, if you want to. Uh, would you all like me to share my screen um, to um, go over the report? I think that you have supplied? to because we're okay. not able to to 
draw no up problem. the committee documents today. Okay. I will. Let me just share my screen first and make sure. Um, okay. Are you are you able to see it? Yep. Okay. Um, so uh, the last time we met, uh, Dale and I were able to go through the first part of this report. And so yeah, I don't know if you'd like us to uh, review it again quickly and get to um, the area where we where we stopped, or if you want us to start you, all over again. Um, uh, get to where we, just review quickly and then get okay. to where, but sure. focus on where we stopped. The okay. Last so um, as the commissioner mentioned, we do a um, every other Friday meeting update and we're, we just use this project report status uh, report. Um, so we summarized everything for you. Um, um, the top of the chart just sort of lets you know who are the main people who are involved in helping us implement the project. And we, we also uh, added what the overview of the project was, just basically saying that it is related to implementing all the strategies related to Act 148. Um, we began uh, implementation of the project, I think actually before Act 148 was passed and signed. Uh, I don't remember the exact date the bill was passed, but we really organized an implementation team in June, identified some very um, uh, expert in our department in each contact area, um, content area around these areas of presumptive parole, furlough, all of the things that are related to the changes of furlough um, and the earned good time rule. We enlisted a lot of our staff, our senior probation and parole officers, caseworkers, uh, victim service specialists. Um, and as the commissioner mentioned, um, there are multiple meetings um, every week um, to really uh, nail out the details of this um, effort and make sure that we're getting all of the information documented so that we can basically uh, do the training and uh, reissue all of the policies for staff. Mm -hmm. So um, that's been happening. We also have regular meetings with the Council of State Governments once their technical assistance grant was approved by the Bureau of Justice Administration. They've been coming to uh, our meetings. They've been looking at our policies. They've been looking at uh, just about any document that we create, providing feedback to us, helping us identify um, best practices from other states and incorporating that into our work. Um, I won't go into all of the details around the significant changes that we're making to our offender management system, other than to say that it's very important that we put um, some effort into making sure that our offender management system can capture data because, as you all know, the, a big part of justice reinvestment is reporting out and um, having the data we need to know if um, the strategies were effective. So we are spending a lot of time uh, working on modifications to our offender management system. And we'll have to continue doing that into um, 2021. We have some things that we know need to be done by January 1st. Uh, we won't have the capacity to get everything organized by then. So we'll just continue uh, implementation uh, into uh, next year. As far as you know, some of the major policy revisions, of course, we were looking at our um, conditions uh, standard and special conditions of furlough. Um, these really relate to the aspects of technical violations and returns, um, looking at contact standards and reducing or modifying those so that it's based on risk and not legal status, which is um, something that uh, I think they've been that way for quite a while. Dale can talk more about that. We obviously have rules and guidance to implement the earned good time program. Um, we're looking at uh, incentives and sanctions also as part of the statute, really um, looking at um, sanctions and, and when someone should be returned, uh, particularly in light of the new definition of technical violation in Act 148. We're also engaging with the community justice centers um, as to have them help us develop strategies for addressing technical violations and incentives. We know, again, we've been talking about this, our community partners are going to be very important uh, for us moving forward, uh, helping to manage cases in the field, uh, particularly if we're unable to um, return people 
um, to incarceration. They've developed a theory of change. Um, the community justice centers and our housing and um, restorative justice unit, a theory of change around meeting housing needs for people who are in transitional housing that is really uh, holistic in nature. And we're preparing an RFP that will go out in January 21st to really change, I think, the um, type of transitional housing that's available in the community right now. Um, we've uh, put together a process to really review and address significant violations that could result in a furlough interrupt or a revocation of more than 90 days. Again, that is related specifically to the uh, requirements in, in Act 148. You heard from Mary Jane Ainsworth, we're working very closely with the parole board um, to make sure that that parole process and the presumptive parole eligibility process is um, smooth and that we, we give the parole board the information that they need in order to make their determinations. Mm -hmm. We know that there's oh, an impact to over 15 department directives and rules. Um, the more I dig, the, the more I find some uh, additional changes that, that need to be made. Um, in addition, we um, are, I guess, boy, starting in a couple of weeks, we have a number of different trainings that are scheduled for our staff on each one of these topic areas. Um, we know that we are going to need to continue working with them um, throughout the course of the year. Um, Dale and I have been saying that January 1st is, is a start of something. It's not um, the end of the planning that we're doing. We're, we're beginning the implementation and we expect that we're going to, you know, have some bumps along the road and we're going to need to continue to support staff and perhaps modify um, some of the um, processes that we're, we're, we're developing. But we do have some trainings scheduled um, right up until Christmas week, I believe, where we will be um, giving more information to staff about the specifics in terms of how they need to do some of this work. So that was a brief overview. And uh, Dale, you wanted to go through the risks and issues, right? You want to yep. take over here? Yes, I can go over the risk issues. Um, hi, for the record, Dale Crook. I am the Director of Field Services for the Vermont Department of Corrections. Um, during this process, uh, Monica, myself, and our team kind of identified uh, issues or problems or risks that we faced during this implementation. Um, the first risk is, is really the reinvestment funds uh, that are recommended by CSG were not appropriate. Um, you know, I know the commissioner has said this multiple times um, that without the community supports in place, um, we don't think that justice reinvestment is gonna be able to ch achieve its goals. Um, you know, the department is fundamentally changing how we do supervision come January 1 and how we respond to technical violations of probation um, and parole and furlough. Um, those offenders, um, we will not be responding um, nearly to the degree or the level with incarceration as we have in the past. Um, that's one of the goals of justice reinvestment is, is around technical violations. Um, without having the resources in place, we'll be leaving, uh, the concern is that we'll be leaving individuals um, out in the community without the appropriate resources um, that are in a, a state of chaos or, or technically violating their conditions um, we don't have an appropriate response of incarceration, and there won't be an appropriate response in the community. So that is one of our, our big concerns um, for implementing JRI and having the outcomes that we all want. Um, a second is issue or risk we've determined is a, the short time frame for the implementation. Um, they go in effect January 1. Um, really, as you kind of saw from what Monica presented, this is a major change um, in the department. Every part of the department has been impacted by justice reinvestment from the facilities to the caseworks to reentry to victim services to community supervision to parole to policy. Um, major changes um, are occurring within the department. Um, while Act 148 has um, some specific changes, it's kind of like throwing a, a rock into a pond. All these ripple effects, you know, we're an integrated system. Um, you can't really change one part of our system without having impacts on other parts of our system. Um, so the short time frame is leading us to have kind of a rolling implementation. Um, January 1, we'll have the statutory requirements um, in place that we have to. Um, what's gonna be happening is we're gonna have other components um, that are connected to justice reinvestment 
um, updated policies and, and practices and like that, that will be implemented um, post January 1. Um, but as I said, the requirements that were specifically laid out in Act 148 will be in effect January 1. It's just it's just a short time frames, um, trying to implement everything um, uh, with the training and the offender management system updates um, was was that was we were really limited in the, in the amount of time that we had to do that. Um, one of the things we requested was additional sentence cop staff uh, through the process with the implant, um, the M the increase of or the addition of um, earned good time into our system. Um, there is a lot more work that our sentence comp unit is going to have to um, be responsible for uh, reviewing and updating sentence comps um, on a much more frequent basis based on on good time. Um, and, and without the additional uh, staff, we have concerns that there will be more uh, errors. It's, it's all human, you know, human based. We have individuals working very difficult, complicated um, situations where they try to um, implement different sentences together. Um, and we'd be worried that, you know, with the increase in work and without having the appropriate staffing levels, um, we could uh, expose the department to more litigations and lawsuits by having incorrect sentence comps. Um, um, obviously, COVID-19 has kind of kind of had some major uh, impact on the department and the implementation as well. Um, you know, we can't meet in person. Um, we're trying to develop training uh, practices and, and, and uh, for staff that aren't, we won't be able to pull together. We'll be doing everything virtually. Um, in addition, that we're kind of, we're implementing some things um, for the future, even though like right now, for um, how can I explain this in a good way? So right now we're operating under kind of COVID-19 protocols and community supervision. Uh, we're reducing our contacts. We're reducing, um, you know, exposures to our staff and offenders that we supervise, trying to make sure we maintain, um, you know, good social distancing that we try to follow the, the guidance of the CDC and uh, the governor um, and all the policies that are coming down around COVID-19. So that has really impacted um, how we do supervision in the community. Um, and so we're trying to implement something where we're really um, not going to be able to implement the way we want come January 1 because we're still operating under kind of our COVID protocols right now. Um, so that's been kind of tricky. And then, and then all the resources um, an exhaustion that just goes with, with dealing with COVID-19. Um, just, you know, our department, every department, um, and basically everyone is having to deal with. Um, uh, there is, we've started to see some um, lawsuits filed in court regarding reintegration furlough, because as of January 1, uh, reintegration furlough stops and earn good time starts. Um, there are individuals, offenders that we have that were sentenced prior that feel that they should be earning their reintegration time. Um, uh, so, so those will be playing out in the courts and, and we'll have to figure out, um, you know, respond to those whenever there's rulings based on those. Um, and then we had the, you know, this was brought up a little bit earlier. Um, there's been a lot of um, input from the victims regarding uh, the rulemaking process of, of earn gun time. Um, you know, very difficult, very emotional responses um, um, that were going through the rulemaking and the, and the comment period um, that, that there be just, you know, a lot of the victims felt that the first time they were aware of good time was when the department reached out for their input on the rule. Um, so um, as we can all expect, there will probably be um, more follow-up regarding the, the victims and in future processes. Um, those are kind of the, the impacts that we've kind of identified now. Um, you know, uh, I'm fine to answer any questions we have regarding the impacts or just what we're doing with the justice free investment. Um, but that's, that's kind of our report that we presented. One comment, Dale, and may, you may want to be prepared for this next week is one of the complaints I heard was from victims, but uh, the victim from the Center for Crime Victim Services was the way victims were notified in a blast email rather than being notified by a victim's advocate. Yeah, I can I can certainly comment on that. 
Um, yeah, we. I mean, it's just next week when you. Uh, okay. Uh, I, you know, that uh, may come up when Chris Fenno testifies. She sure. Was concerned about the way they were moving. Would you all like me to stop sharing the screen now, or do you want me yeah, to keep that? Yeah, that would be fine. I think I don't, unless somebody wants to. I, um, Peggy did send out an email with all the documents on it, so we do have access that way. Um, but it's difficult to keep track of that, plus the agenda. Um, other uh, questions for Dale or Monica about the uh, Representative Hooper? And then Representative Lyons, uh, Senator Lyons, excuse me. Oh my God. Uh, Thank you. Um, the statement is made in that last slide that we saw that we didn't appropriate the two million dollars for justice reinvestment. Can can you help me understand where this is falling apart? For we did make under the circumstances, fairly significant investments in transitional housing, tried to push some money to CJCs, did some money to domestic violence or diversion, plus added, allowed the department to retain the savings and out-of-state beds, all of which amounted to more than $2 million, I believe. I totally get the issue with CRF money and the limitations there, but I, 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 we need to be, so help me understand what the flaws were and what you should be proposing to us um, in the next budget to implement this. I, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Um, Representative Hooper, I, you, you just touched on it, right? Some of that money was mixed in with CRF money, which has, you know, significant limitations and the investment in, in the uh, justice centers and uh, so on. Um, it really goes back to, and, and again, the funding that went for domestic violence, you know, went, went to the folks that are providing the domestic violence programming. Um, it goes back to um, the issue of, we deal with, uh, and, and, and again, tomorrow during the presentation of the working group, you're, you're gonna see a, a significant number. And I, I don't have it right here in front of me. For some reason, it's 57% uh, sticks in my head. I could be wrong. Of the people returned have underlying mental health and substance abuse issues. And greatly appreciate the support on the housing, but we've got to rethink our housing. Um, just giving transitional housing and the funding doesn't free up the housing. You know, we still have people living in situations such as hotel, uh, transitional housing type environment. Um, we have to rethink and come up with a better model of transitional housing, um, especially around the issues of substance abuse when people fail and they just don't go back into the facility. So when, when we talk about the areas where we need help, it comes back to community capacity again. That's, that's the area where we need significant help. And, you know, Dal said it, and um, I think he was pretty clear on it. If we don't resolve the capacity in the community to provide those services, and again, I, I don't want to be generalizing and being um, uh, attacking the folks that do the good work in the communities, but, but, a, but a lot of folks don't want to work with the population we supervise. And we have to work through that if we're going to be successful. So those are the areas that we're concerned about. And, um, you know, again, um, where does that funding come from is, is the question about where it comes from. I do think some of its coordination, which is starting to happen inside AHS. So th thank you for that. I, I, I appreciate and I hear what you're saying. We need, in, in my view, we need significant guidance from, from you because you all are the experts in building these budgets so that we have something that is appropriate to the need. Otherwise, we're just going to keep flailing around and um, appro appropriating money in, in the way we have in the past. So I just, I 
I've said this before, and I, I look forward to seeing a budget that stands up these services to implement you know, the change that we're talking about here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Senator Lyons, what am I doing to you? I don't know. If you're, you're promoting me again. What's going on? Uh, I don't know. You'd certainly be a strong leader in the House. There. <laughs> They're having a race. Uh, so listen, um, thank you for that. I, my question really is also around transitional housing and the nature of the RFP. Um, I attended a, a meeting on housing um, on Friday. And of course, the needs are significant across the state you know, for those who are homeless, uh, those with mental health or substance use disorder, and also those uh, coming out of corrections. And we've been after this for, I, I don't know how many different um, election cycles, we've brought up transitional housing. So your comment about a new model, I think is, import is an important one but also the linkage with VHCB funding. And I don't know if that and how that is happening. And then the underlying suggestion of how do we get at the, the need, a need-based services and need-based housing. So um, I'm just gonna throw out that general, those general comments and, and see where you folks are in terms of working with others in AHS or VHCB or community partners uh, to build the model that you're talking about. Yes. Um, sure. Go, go ahead, Joe. Go ahead. So, I mean, we, we procure uh, transitional housing through an RFP process and, and um, we have looked at how uh, our transitional housing has played out over the last couple of years. Um, and we've made some fundamental changes that we're, we're trying to implement through the justice reinvestment and through changing our transitional housing through our change process. Um, to really spell out the services that we want, um, you know, where a lot of the rub kind of comes down is with, with substance abuse, for example. And transitional housing uh, places and and it's not a right or wrong. Um, it just doesn't meet our needs. When someone comes up and they test positive or they use a substance, um, the transitional housing or the organization that manages that house is looking at the house as a whole. So if one individual is violating the rules or is coming up, you know, or using drugs, they view that that is risking the other nine individuals. Um, so they've set up their systems based on that. Um, those systems don't work for the, the department and the population that we deal with. So we're putting out RFPs that will better address the needs and the look um, at the population that we're dealing with. Um, so come, you know, sometime in January, they'll be going out. Hopefully we'll have um, some good competition out there uh, as far as responders. But, but there, there is a risk that um, we won't get the plethora of housing options that we need or would like. Um, so it's, it's really, um, you know, crucial that we can get out there and match the needs of our population um, with the housing out there. We have very high needs, co-occurring, substance abuse, um, transient, um, you know, a lot of criminal thinking. Um, so they're very complicated individuals. And, and we're looking at how we provide those services. You know, just having a sober bed per se, it's not really working. I mean, I think we've have enough enough data that says it's not working. It it actually um, kind of stimulates our churn uh, because they go out and they get violated and they lose their housing and they go back to jail for violations that the department wouldn't be responding on otherwise. Um, so we're looking at other models like that that will support the offender that will not, um, you know, more of a risk harm model than an abstinence model. Um, just, just in order to maintain um, stability out in the community. Um, we're hoping we get some more, we're looking at more of a housing first model as well. Um, for example, Pathways is a housing first model. Um, those services seem to do pretty well with our population or better than just traditional transitional housing. Um, so, so in essence, our, our proposals are gonna be 
this is a this is where we need to spend our money and hopefully we have um a, a lot of good competition to, to provide those services uh but there is a concern that that some areas might not be as well represented as others so senator sears i have a a question can i just follow sure up? go ahead jenny just very briefly um so in terms of the availability of transitional housing, I think is part of the question and how that is being resolved in terms of um, working, for example, as just one example, working with VHCB um, or, or others. I know, and so availability of housing, but then as you have suggested, um, lack of availability of uh, counseling and and other treatment i mean that that's absolutely huge and particularly now with covid so the model that um commissioner baker suggested the new model i think uh is probably an important consideration yes agreed I understand that that there are so many moving parts with justice reinvestment um it's like trying to align all the stars um, to hit a home run, right? So how the department supervises, um, how our reentry services work is changing, how our transitional housing um, will coordinate with the, the probation officer and the reentry plans, how our community services and providers will provide the services that's needed, you know, how the courts will change their conditions or their sentencing or their sentencing structures, how the community is gonna respond to the behaviors um, of our population and what supports the community can provide. So it's, it's really trying to coordinate, um, like oh, the whole village have to come to play here. Um, you know, the department can't do it all by itself. Uh, it's, 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 we can't control all the parts that we need to do to make uh, justice reinvestment um, really deliver in the way that I think that, that Vermont wants. Senator. Uh, that um, Senator Hooker, the um, by the way, congratulations on your election as the yeah. assistant yeah. majority leader of the Senate. Uh, Thank you. Or, or better known as the whip. <laughs> I can see it now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Uh, I, I just am wondering if we have a spreadsheet or something that shows how many people in, you know, in areas of the state are in need of more permanent housing. I know that Rutland is suffering yet again of a, an instance where there's some transitional housing that's, you know, there's been a, another tragedy. And um, I'm really concerned that we get a handle on the numbers of people that we need to put in more stable housing in each area. Because right now, and I know that it's fluid, I know that it changes, but um, you know, we were really proud of what uh, AHS did when, when uh, the pandemic hit and we were able to, to house 2000 individuals or whatever, upwards of 2000, um, but now, you know, how many of those people are still in hotels? Um, what are we looking at and, and who are they? How many of them are, are people who have been um, released and, and just needed a place? Um, how many of them are families? I mean, these are things that uh, I think we need to look at. And I'm, I'm very disappointed that some of the money that we received here uh, isn't going to be used or seems not to be able to be used um, before the deadline for CRF money um, being spent. And I'm hoping that the federal government comes up with a plan so that we can continue to move forward in um, utilizing that money for more permanent housing. But do you have any uh, you know, data that would show us geographically what we're looking at? So we'll be able to show you where we have procured beds across the state. Um, that necessarily doesn't line up with the need as we have to, basically we have to put uh, beds out there and proposals and we, and we kind of coordinate with whatever providers is out there. Um, some areas um, are better representative than others. Um, 
but if we put out an RFP and, and no one bids on a proposal, we, we can't provide and procure the services for that area. Um, you know, one thing to understand is, is we will probably be looking at a portfolio that includes less housing, but more services per bed. So we're going from like a mass mass housing to more specialized and focusing is, is how we're going to try to turn um, because the churn is not helping. We need to get people out and more stabilized um, and have better coordinated services with our, with our partners out there to, 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 to get individuals out and stabilized. Um, the most uh, riskiest and challenging time for our offenders is the first 90 days they're released. So the better we can have them released into a stable place and connected to the services that we need, uh, the better their chances of staying out are. You know, the longer an individual is out post-release, the chances are that they get returned drop. You know, there's a drop after 90 days, there's a drop after six months, there's a drop after one year. So getting individuals out and getting them stabilized for longer periods of time will reduce their um, propensity to go back to, to jail based on violations or new behaviors or criminal behaviors. Um, so it's, it's really, tr it's really important that we get the correct services and housing partners matched up with our population. If, if I could follow up and then Senator Hooker and follow up. Dale, one of, one of the, and, and perhaps next week is a good time for that discussion, but in obtaining those services to keep people from being rearrested or be incarcerated. Um, we need to know where the lapses are in those services in the community. I think that's, you know, the basis of, of our concern. Um, I think we're all at a point where we want to see the people that are dangerous locked up, but not locking up people that are uh, not dangerous. Um, you know, and I, I remember Peg Flory hitting the nail on the head years ago with her statement that, you know, we need to lock up those that we need to, you know, be afraid of, but not those that are paying the neck. And um, I think the, I, I certainly have my share of pains in the neck in my area and everybody else does in theirs, but should they be locked up? And I think that's the concern. So maybe you can on that too. I, I think it's very possible. It's definitely that we can talk about it uh, at the next time. Um, and we could probably bring in some, some of our, um, you know, Kim Bushy or Andy Rimziano, who, who they really know the, the mental health and the substance abuse inner workings a lot better than I do. Um, but one thing that we, that, you know, that's glaring on their end is the fact that the services out there aren't really geared for the criminal justice capable uh, system. So, you know, there's a big difference when, um, you know, someone that is a substance abuse user and they choose themselves to get clean and they go for counseling and the service they want to get, get help, as opposed to someone who is, in essence, being forced, you know, jail or treatment. So you go to treatment and, and that's a different population to work with. They're more manipulating. Sometimes they, you know, they've they've managed. There's trauma uh, geared with them that they have to be able to address better. Um, so that's a different population. That that I think is one of the biggest weaknesses that we see in our system um, is that we don't have uh, the providers out there that are specifically geared toward our population, or as the commissioner said, that wants to deal with our population. Um, but I think the questions that you're getting from the committee are geared toward what do we need to do to get that service available in the community that's geared to your population rather than geared to, and it, by the way, not necessarily easy for people to, you know, but to other groups. I mean, I don't want to suggest that it's easy to change a lifetime of addiction and and, um, <clears throat> you know, even though you're motivated. Um, Senator, I, I know you, but, but how, I think that's the real basis of the question is how do we get those services that you need in the community available to you and not necessarily, I think that was the hardest Senator uh, Hooker and Senator Lyons questions 
for how do we get those services that you need, not necessarily the services that and know, it's just, a did, program uh, wants to provide. Can I just quickly insert as a follow-up to my previous questions, comments? Sure. That, that is um, the, um, the integrated system, the new system would have to take into consideration new needs. And some of those new needs I'm, I'm thinking have been identified uh, within the AHS. And so one of the comments that we heard from the commissioner was um, that we do need a new system. So I'm, I, I'm gonna go back and ask my question again of the commissioner because I think, how are we approaching this and who is at the table to build that new system and understand the various counseling or significant housing needs that are out there across the state. So that's my question. So let, 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 let me answer that, Senator. Um, and, and we will come back um, next week at, at the uh, next week's hearing to talk a little bit more in detail about this, but I, I'm just gonna, you know, um, this is what I hear from staff, and I'm just going to be frank about it, that the designated agencies do not have an interest in working with the population that we have. I hear what you're saying. And we all know the challenges around mental health. And there is a, there is a, work, there is a designated person inside AHS that's working within the framework of the working group for reinvestment, along with CSG. I, I just had this conversation with CSG last week that they're helping with the conversation uh, inside AHS and, and starting to identify the processes moving forward. But, but candidly, we just haven't had a lot of time to do that inside corrections. Um, there's a few things going on. And uh, you know, we, we, haven't, we haven't had time to, to really focus on rebuilding the ship because we're focused on other areas of trying to stabilize the ship. And so um, I appreciate um, the questioning and I understand where you're going, um, but, but um, there, there's a lot of challenges in this area of getting people to understand that someone who comes out of jail into the community um, needs to move further up in the line of getting services. And when you hear me talk about a model, I'm going to go back, you know, again, I, I, I don't like to keep going back to this. I know Senator Hooker likes to hear it, but, you know, what we're really talking about is a project vision model. Uh, uh, the opiate addiction model is the model we need. We, when, when we trans, you know, when you, when you keep asking what should it look like, we, transaction some, we trans, um, transition someone to the community out of a facility that has underlying mental health and substance abuse issues, it should be all hands on deck with all services in the community. It shouldn't be these one-offs that are occurring. And I feel after being here 10 or 11 months, there's a lot of one-offs. I hear people competing for dollars, right? This group wants money because they need more money to do more work. What really needs to happen is the same thing that happened in my days in Rutland. Um, we have to figure out if there's enough money and capacity in the system to collaborate the way we need to collaborate to wrap ourselves around those people coming back into the community. But quite frankly, in the community, it's not a real, um, in many cases, it's not a real good feeling supporting those folks coming into the community because the services are going elsewhere. And so what the message we're trying to deliver here is that that level of collaboration um, in some ways is out of the control of the Department of Corrections, but it's in control of the people who funnel money to those other groups. And I'd love to have you know, a, a longer conversation about this because again, my vision for this is it's, it's all hands on deck when somebody arrives in the community with the element of holding them accountable for their behavior and their impact on the community. So that's the reason why we're doing the work with the National Network for Safe Communities out of John Jay College with the domestic violence piece. But it's gonna take time to bring these things together. Um, and there is work going on and the conversation is happening. But I would urge folks that sit on the steering committee for justice reinvestment too, um, to pay particular attention to that point 
when those conversations come up tomorrow. So I don't know if that makes sense to you, Senator. Or no, no, I think you're on the, you're on the track. Well, Thank I don't you. know what's happening in my audio. Um, but I do know that Representative Hooper has been patiently um, waiting to ask, ask a question. But I think you really have hit the nail on the head here about part of the problem is the services in the community not matching the needs of the offenders who are returning to the community. Representative Hooper. Thank you. I ag agree with this conversation, but I want to maybe complicate it some more. Um, yes, we need to do a better job of matching um, and asking for those services to be where they are. But given the challenging nature of some of the folks who need services, as well as you know, trying to provide these services across state government, I mean, across the state of Vermont. I wonder if we need to also be having a conversation about, um, about alternative ways of delivering the service rather than saying, how do we put more into the community and how do we build better wraparound services? Should we also be having a conversation about transitional services that are under the control and operation of the Department of Corrections so that you are running, the DOC is running um, a transitional facility and able to bring those sort of services directly to a population of people. I'm not disputing the fact that we need to, the more we can push out into the community, the better. But it strikes me that there is a group that we're not going to be able to serve appropriately. And instead of saying, darn it, why can't we do it in the community? Let's figure out a different way to approach that. And I think there have been conversations, at least in house institutions, about how to do that. But so I just would be interested in quick response to that. Thank you. So you're talking. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. So, no, go ahead you, so I just want to be clear. So you're looking at the department actually running the transitional housing themselves. I, I'm thinking uh, about that, and I believe there are models in other yep. parts of the country where um, you you have a step down facility or an alternative set of services that can be provided to people. Um, as they get ready to come out into the community, rather than just going yep. directly from prison to community. No, I just wanted to be clear. I understood the question. So, so there are, um, you know, a lot of other systems have halfway houses um, that are either either public or private. So, right. So, some of them they contract out like we do. Some of them the departments themselves run. Um, I, I, you know, this is really, you know. Uh, uh -huh. A difficult can it be done we, we probably could do that um but that those all those processes um you know we have difficult times now providing services um, and getting community input and community buy-in um it, where we place you know housing we used to um 15 20 years ago have f they called them fsu apartments but we provided apartments for our population um and we've uh, you know got a lot of um, negative commentary about that because we would put individuals in these housing and neighborhoods that were really impoverished because that's, you know, that's um, where we could afford as far as the state and the outcomes weren't really that, that great. Um, you know, the benefit is, is we controlled the housing and once someone was able and able for release, we had a place where we could put them. Um, so it really didn't, I don't know if it really gave us the outcomes that we were looking for. And that was also based on, you know, from 20 years ago and a lot has changed in, in how we do things from 20 years ago. Um, but, you know, I think the commissioner can weigh in, like that's a conversation, um, you know, with um, a huge community impact um, that's gonna okay. have to be navigated. Well, um uh, Monica, did you want to respond to that? And then Representative Emmons has a question or a response. 
Oh, I just wanted to add a little bit more information. I think uh, Representative Hooper did mention that you know this this conversation's happened a few times, and at least in my tenure at the Department of Corrections, we've we've submitted two different reports <coughs> to the legislature about different types of um, reentry facilities. You know, one was around repurposing um, the Southeast State um, property to a facility, and the other one was just around and maybe building one um, and what that would look like and the cost that might have been associated with that. Um, so there is some work that the department did put into that that we provided to the legislature in the past that might you know, serve as a starting point for a conversation. Representative uh, Emmons, did you have a comment or question? Yes, I'd just like to weigh in a little bit on this. Um, you know, one thing I go back to what Representative Hooper started her first question, line of questioning on the budget and coming in with a plan on how you really address this and the whole and I go back to what Commissioner Baker was saying that everybody is looking at protecting their own budget and um, The issue is we deal in silos and in the budget making process, everyone is out there protecting their department or, ag or agency, but particularly their department. And I think that gets right back to what Representative Hooper was saying. When a budget's being proposed to the legislature, it needs to look a little different um, in terms of not having all the silos and people protecting their department and really looking at this particular issue in a cohesive manner. So that's one of the things things that I was thinking about, and it builds a little bit on what Commissioner Baker was talking about in Project Vision, that you really look at this population and you get around a table with all the departments and entities because the money is there. It's just you have to redirect it in a way that is more effective than protecting people's budget. That being said, I'm also interested in what Representative Hooper was talking about about different initiatives to help people transition into the communities. And I think back to the old days when the men were in Chittenden, they had work programs that they had a unit in the Chittenden facility that the inmates that had earned it and were getting close to their reentry re day could go out, out into the community and work and then come back to the facility at night. We also had the Windsor Correctional Facility as a minimum security facility about 25 years ago, where folks were getting towards the end of their sentence, still needed more support than being out in the community. And they would go to the Windsor Correctional Facility to um, learn some trades and get ready for reentry. There's also models that we've been looking at in Maine and New Hampshire at the women's correctional facilities for, for women to transition within a facility or within the complex to a less secure building and more supportive in terms of their treatment. And I think that's the issue that Representative Hooper was talking about more so than just having um, apartments and buildings that DOC puts money in their budget to pay the lease. That we have a coordinated approach while a person is still with, within an incarcerative setting to help them transition to the community while the services are be, being provided to them. Probably more with DOC in a way, but I say that hesitantly because I think what happens within the service community, because no one does wanna deal with this population, they say, well, corrections can deal with it. So corrections is always the fallback and I don't want corrections to have to deal with this totally on its own. Um, but that's, that's just some of my thoughts that when, when Representative Hooper mentions about DOC providing more support, it's not necessarily out in the community. It's before the person transitions to the community. So those are just some of my thoughts. Anyone else with any further questions? If not, would um, I think it's time to move on to the next uh, agenda item. Represent uh, Senator Hooker, did you have? Just, just one comment about um, the availability of staff to 
to um, staff programs like this. I mean, corrections has an issue with staff now and how do we um, facilitate that? <clears throat> and what Representative Hooper said about sort of strategically targeting in the budget where you would want the money spent. So we need to have a, a clear indication of that, I think, so that we can um, have a conversation that solve some of these problems. One of the realities we need to actually understand is that we've reduced by about 500 people, those that are incarcerated. We have in invested heavily in pretrial diversion and diverting people from the criminal justice system so that those that are now under corrections are different than those that were years ago in the community correctional centers and working their way out. We have a, a what we tried to accomplish, we're to some extent accomplishing where we have much more violent population incarcerated, where are much more difficult, complex individuals who are incarcerated. So um, when I was first entered into corrections, I remember a comment from Warden Smith of the old Windsor prison, who said to Governor Snelling, I think it was, or Dean Davis, I guess, um, if you want a better prison, then send me a better class of prison. I do think that we have um, really made a lot of accomplishments. So those that we're dealing with are much more difficult today. Senator, I, I know you want to move on, but I just, uh, I, I feel the urge just to close out the conversation yep. by saying to folks that there is a lot of creative thinking going on inside corrections. You know, we're rethinking the high school to turn it to a, a much more uh, therapeutic boarding school type model. You know, we're in conversations with developing skills. These things take a lot of time um, to move away from what the other models are. And again, I appreciate um, everyone's comments about, you know, we have made a lot of progress, not we, me, because I'm new here over the years, but this population is very difficult to deal with. And there's going to be mistakes made. Things are going to happen in the community um, because they're a different, a difficult population. And uh, so I, I, I'm hearing what everyone is saying, and uh, we're going to take it back and process it and continue to develop. But we, to, to Senator Hooker's point, we we can reallocate staffing inside the agency because the, the security side of the house is one thing where the shortages. We have capacity to change the way we supervise in the community with what we have for staff in the field. We have that capacity. So I'll end it there, Senator, because I know you want to move on. It's a Thank you. For a longer uh, day. You know, you and Matt are on, scheduled for 11.30 um, on the report of the death of Kenneth Johnson, and maybe we'll move that to about 11.15 um, if you're both available, you and Matt. Yes. Um, Centurion, we've reached out to them, but they have not thus far agreed to justify, um, which is probably no surprise. Um, so I'm gonna move on to uh, David Chair and Matt Raymond, who are here from the Attorney General's office. There was a bill at the end of the August session regarding the sexual exploitation of children that came from the uh, House Judiciary Committee um, through the House. And then those of us on the Senate Judiciary Committee were dealing with it. Um, there was a lot of concern about um, the First Amendment and uh, and other um, issues. Uh, and uh, we asked the Attorney General for a report on the sexual exploitation of children. The, uh, the Attorney General has provided that report and has um, David Scherer is here, the Assistant, Gen Assistant Attorney General, and um, as well as Matt Raymond. And uh, why don't you present the report? Uh, and then if there's questions, we can move from there. David, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Senator. And thanks for having us today. I, I, Mr. Raymond and I were thinking that it might make sense for me to do a very brief introduction of the topic. Uh, and then let him talk for a few minutes about what the Internet Crimes Against Task, uh, Children Task Force does, uh, just to give the panel some, the committee some general in, 
informational background and then I'll jump back on and go a little bit into a little bit more detail about the law uh, if that is okay with the committee. Sounds good to me. I was muted. All right. <laughs> Thank you. So as the members of the committee have received, um, we did submit a report uh, focused heavily on the question of constitutionality re regarding the proposal for outlawing simulated uh, depictions of simulated sexual conduct in um, child sexual abuse materials, which uh, formerly were referred to as child pornography. Um, and the, as the as Senator Sears noted, this was there were some issues of concern around the constitutionality of that. Uh, the report that I submitted goes into that in great detail, and I'll uh, go over that not in quite as much detail as the written report, but I'll go over some of the highlights of that uh, after the committee gets an overview of the practical, factual side of this, which I think will be very helpful to provide the context for uh, why we're making this request. Um, and uh, for those who may be watching who uh, did not receive that in the email, the report is available on the Vermont Legislature's website at the uh, uh, reports section of it, so uh, you can uh, access that there. Uh, with that, I'll turn that over to uh, Investigator Matt Raymond, who will talk a bit about what his unit does and uh, a little bit about the practical side of this request. Before Matt, um, the basic issue, and I think it was Senator Baruth that brought it up in Senate Judiciary, I could be wrong, but um, was the depict, when you have a movie that depicts a child, we've had movies like uh, Taxi with Jodie Foster, that, I think that was the one that came up. She was playing a prostitute at the age of 13 years old in the movie. That was really what led us to this question, right? And that's what the report tries to um, recommend language for a bill that would, um, in terms of the simulation, am I correct? That's right, Senator. You, you correctly stated the concern that- and If Senator Baruth wants to defend himself. I, I think that sums it up. It was- uh, you're the defender of the First Amendment. Well, also, Marshall Paul testified that he had, uh, in his own library at home, he had three films that he thought contravened the proposed language, and nobody wanted to uh, believe that it could possibly be um, worth criminalizing those films. So we kicked it, as I remember, to this committee. That's right. And, and the proposal, uh, we believe, would plainly not criminalize the examples that uh, uh, Deputy Defender General Paul brought up last uh, earlier this year. Um, and we crafted the language carefully uh, using New York state law that has been found to be constitutional. And, and for a little bit of broader context, this it, the outlawing simulations along these lines uh, in the way that we are proposing is something that is done by about 44 states, Washington, D.C., and the federal government. So we're not uh, being legal adventurers. In, this. in fact, um, we are very much in the minority by not outlawing this. And as I'll go into in a little bit more detail in a few minutes, uh, the way we're crafting the proposal puts some safeguards around it that would not outlaw artistic expression of the type that Marshall Paul was, was talking about. Thank you. Matt, did you want to tell us a little bit what's happening? Yes, um, I'm the commander of the Vermont Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, um, which is a task force made up of um, local, state, and federal law enforcement officers. Um, and we focus on the sexual exploitation of children uh, by people that <laughs> use the internet or um, technology to do so. We um, Traditionally, have been uh, there's like three legs of the ICAC. There's investigations, forensics, and education, um, and this obviously deals with the investigation side. Um, and we've done in the past both proactive and reactive investigations. But uh, quite frankly, over the last 
year or a little more, um, our proactive side is pretty much, uh, you know, not being utilized because we have so many complaints coming in on the reactive side. We get uh, the majority of our complaints from cyber tips from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, who um, electronic service providers like Facebook, Yahoo, Google, uh, you know, any, any type of um, interface um, send complaints to NECMEC when they find child exploitation on their sites. Um, and that can be either child pornography or lowering an enticement of a child. And um, then they, the NECMEC sends those to the correct ICAC. There's 61 ICACs across the country. Vermont, there's one that, that goes across the entire state. We get those complaints uh, and then review them and uh, to see if we're accepting them for investigation. And we've been just absolutely swamped. The numbers of these complaints just continue to skyrocket um, and we just can't, can't keep up with them. As part of that, um, we see, uh, we've seen quite a bit uh, uptick on the simulated sexual conduct. And um, it's kind of harsh to say, but uh, what we're talking about is usually a clothed child um, that is, um, a lot of times this is a, a young girl, um, you know, preteen, very young, um, in front of a naked male uh, where you can't tell from the camera angle if her mouth is actually touching his penis or not, but it's so close as, as to if it may be. Um, and currently that is not uh, considered child pornography under Vermont law, but it is in most states and the federal government. Um, and that the original uh, request was to fix that uh, issue. Um, we have these cases pop up all the time and um, it seems to be a loophole uh, that people can get away with, uh, you know, uh, the exploitation of children with. And I was hoping that uh, we can get that fixed. Thank you very much, uh, Investigator. And obviously if folks have question for, questions for him, feel free to uh, jump in at any time or, or jump in at the end here. I'll, I'll just give a brief overview the, of the report that I submitted. It goes into great detail uh, about the legal issues and arguments, but I'll try to give you the main concepts here, and then I'm happy to answer questions uh, and uh, clarify anything that you might need. Um, the basic proposal we're submitting, I'll, I'll just read it out loud. It's, it's fairly brief. It would be to uh, make one additional subsection in the statute under Vermont law that defines what sexual conduct is for the purpose of child sexual abuse materials. Um, and the additional section would read the following. It would be at the bottom of the, um, the list uh, that defines what sexual conduct is, the, very act, the various acts that define what sexual conduct is. And this was what it would say. Uh, and this can be found on page two report for those who may be looking at that. Uh, it says, any simulation of the above conduct, <clears throat> purposes of this chapter, simulated means the explicit depiction of any of the conduct set forth in this subsection, which creates the appearance of such conduct, and which exhibits any uncovered portion of the breasts, genitals, or buttocks. Uh, two things I want to note initially about what this does uh, and how it interacts with other aspects of the law in terms of the behavior that it might criminalize. One is that this is more narrow than the proposal that our office brought forward to the Judiciary Committees earlier this year. It was narrowed by including the requirement for there to be some nudity that's visible, nudity being defined as uncovered portion of the breast genital or buttocks. This would eliminate a lot of hypotheticals you might uh, think about involving uh, a, a young person in a more sort of what we might say artistic uh, presentation around uh, dealing with young people and sexuality uh, because if there's, no, if there's no nudity of the type that's defined in there, it simply wouldn't be covered by the law. The other thing that's important to note is that all of the crimes that they apply to require there to be an actual child involved in the creation of the depiction. In other words, you could not, it would not be the case that if there is an actor or actress 
over 16 under Vermont law, 16 is the cutoff. Um, if there's an actor or actress who's over that age, who is pretending to be younger, that would not qualify as a crime because that would not be a child by under Vermont definition. So I think that those two things are important aspects to understand uh, and to clarify with respect to this constitutional issue. We are not talking about simulations that, and, and it would not be a crime for simulations that involve uh, or, or an actor or actress who's over 16, uh, and it is not a crime when there is not the nudity that is uh, defined in this subsection. So those are, I think, two key things to understand. And again, the nudity piece is something that narrows this proposal and I think uh, would eliminate a number of, or quite a number of hypotheticals that one might come up with. With respect to the legality of this under First Amendment law, again, as I mentioned before, this is the majority position in the United States, the great majority. You know, Vermont's very much in, in a um, very small minority and not having a statute on the books that is similar to this. Um, the Supreme Court, in a series of cases that I've outlined in the report, outlined the rule. Uh, and, and the basic rule is the following, uh, and I'll read this off the report, it's not too long. A depiction of sexual conduct that was produced using an actual child involved in the conduct, whether the conduct was simulated or actual, is not protected speech under the First Amendment, and it may be criminalized. Depictions of child sexual abuse that were not produced using an actual child, in other words, virtual depictions, uh, perhaps that might be computer simulated or something like that. Those are protected speech under the First Amendment. Um, and that, again, that was sort of, uh, it comes from a series of cases, Ferber, Ashcroft, uh, and then this Williams case, which, which I would say the Williams case clarified some of those earlier laws. It didn't particularly change it. Um, but those are, that, or I should say, that is the basic rule here. Uh, it is law, it is within the bounds of the First Amendment. It is acceptable to outlaw depictions that um, are that involve an actual child in their production. Um, and that that is not protected by the First Amendment. Virtual imagery that does not involve an actual child is not sorry is protected by the First Amendment. And what we propose here today uh, is very much within the. Um, within the lines of that rule. The Vermont statute, as I just mentioned, already limits um, what is outlawed to depictions involving an actual child. And when we introduce the simulated language, that does not change. It will still be a requirement that there be an actual child. We are not proposing to outlaw virtual uh, pornography, uh, child pornography in the way that Ashcroft says is, is not allowable. And just briefly, I'll note the sort of seminal case, and we had some considerable, considerable discussion about this case earlier this year, but the seminal case on this is actually Ferber uh, versus New York. And it's important to note that the language we are proposing here is very close to a copy of the New York state statutes. Uh, and that was a, a considered decision in that the New York state statutes were themselves litigated up to the United States Supreme Court and the US Supreme Court did hold them to be constitutional. So we, uh, you know, we're, we're very much within the pattern of something that the Supreme Court has already found constitutional. There are other uh, statutes, including the federal statute, frankly, which are a little bit more loosely defined than the one we're proposing. Uh, we are really on the cautious end of this um, in terms of uh, making sure we are writing within the lines of uh, the First Amendment. I think we're well within, within those lines. And, and Ferber basically does say that um, child pornography, of course, is not protected uh, speech under the Constitution and that it is even, it is less protected than other materials that might be considered to be obscene. And the reason it says that is because the state has a 
extraordinary interest, a compelling interest in protecting children from the type of abuse that is involved in producing these images. Uh, so they have less protection than the sort of normal obscene material that might be uh, considered not protected by the first uh, And they did, Ferber does note, Ferber does make a distinction between, uh, it notes that simulated material is in fact something that is uh, not protected by the constitution. It notes with approval the New York statute that defines simulated to be, uh, simulated activity to be uh, unlawful. Uh, and it, it even has a brief discussion in there about the fact that uh, if you need to, if there's some lawful purpose, artistic purpose, or perhaps scientific explanatory purpose, um, there are ways to do that that are that would not be outlawed. Uh, so Ferber really contemplates this and discusses this this line drawing between um, unlawful simulated activity and portrayals that may actually have merit in ways that should not be outlawed. And they note that that can still be done. You can still make those portrayals under this uh, law uh, and, and be protected by the First Amendment. Ashcroft then steps in a couple decades, a few decades later, and uh, no, a couple decades later, sorry, and makes a, makes a tweak to that and says, Virtual images, images that were that where there was no child involved in the production, are in fact protected by the First Amendment. And the reason they say that is because the reasoning underlying Ferber, the policy reason underlying Ferber, is that you need to protect children from the grave harm that results from the from the production of these materials. And if there is no child involved in the production, then that harm has not been perpetrated and the interest involved in um, pulling something outside of First Amendment protection has disappeared. And for that reason, those virtual images are going to be protected by the First Amendment. And again, we were very careful in this statute to make sure that we are not falling afoul of Ashcroft. And again, I would note that this is not an unusual thing to do. I said before, 44 states, DC and the federal government do what we are proposing to do uh, with respect to having- Senate, Senator Ruth has a question. You're muted, Senator. Sorry, David, didn't mean to interrupt you, but I I did want to ask, this, this looks much, uh, I wouldn't call it a, a no brainer, but it, it seems a much easier choice to move forward with. I note that um, the Defender General's office was in consultation with you. Is Would that be Marshall Paul? Because you two were the, uh, you know, interlocutors on this in our committee. Um, is, is this a joint effort from the both of you? It, I, I did consult with Marshall. Uh, it is not a joint effort. As I noted in the report, the Defender General still is still their opinion that this is unconstitutional. Again, I think that we disagree with that and we think the law is quite clear on this. It's, it's, not, a, uh, it's not a stretch at all. Not only is it not a stretch, I think the, the law is quite clear that this is constitutional, our proposal is constitutional. Uh, but I did note in the report that um, the Defender General's office still disagrees with that. And I'm sure when we discuss this further, they will bring forward their arguments on the other side. Okay, well, at first blush and reading through your report, it seems to meet my objections to the, to the previous language. I did have an, another question for you about the last point you made on Ashcroft, where you were talking about virtual conduct and the, the judgment of the court being that there was no crime committed because it was merely virtual. So uh, when um, Matt Raymond was talking about proactive uh, attempts to catch these sorts of criminals. One of the things I've always wondered is that, unless I'm mistaken, there can be a, a, a sort of virtual situation where a police officer in a barracks pretends to be a child and then uh, a child predator um, 
engages in a, in a colloquy with them and then they agree to meet and that's regarded as a crime. And I've always thought that was interesting because there is no child involved at any stage in that. It seems a, a simulated child in both cases. What makes one legal and the other um, mm. not legal? I can, uh, I'll give a brief answer to that. And if uh, Matt Raymond wants to jump in uh, and provide a little more context, he's welcome to do that as well. Uh, basically, we're talking about different crimes here. Uh, and when you're talking about the situation you mentioned with uh, somebody who's actually an officer uh, eliciting uh, um, or, or you know, interacting with somebody who demonstrates an intent to do something, you're talking about an attempted offense. Uh, of course, in, in those cases, there may be no child sexual abuse material, but talking about an attempt to commit essentially a child sexual assault. Um, and as, as long as there's uh, evidence that's garnered to show that this person really did take a step towards doing it, um, then the crime of, a, of an attempted um, child sexual assault of some type, and there's different types of mm -hmm. them categorized under, or an attempted lewd and lascivious conduct. Um, that's where that type of uh, behavior will fall into the criminal code. Okay, so similar to a conspiracy charge, where you have to take one one concrete action toward toward the commission of a crime, but not actually commit the crime. Um, yeah, similar to that in that if you're a member of a conspiracy, uh, it's, conspiracy is a slightly different analysis, but I, I, okay. I think that your basic comparison makes sense uh, in that there has to be, you have to have participated in a conspiracy in some way sufficiently to show that uh, you actually did mean to uh, help commit the underlying crime. It's not mm -hmm. exactly the same uh, legal language in terms of how we explain those two things, but there is some conceptual similarity <clears throat> where a prosecutor has to show sufficient action to uh, prove the attempt or in the conspiracy case to prove the uh, that somebody was part of the conspiracy. Okay, thanks very much. And, uh, um, if I may, yeah. any yeah, way to ahead, that. Um, so the protection against the anime or the virtualization of children, you have to realize that's nothing more than a, a drawing, right? As there's no real kids involved. So it would be criminalizing a drawing or a, a painting. Uh, not, you know, obviously uh, that's protected uh, free speech and that, that's why. But in the case of the luring where they, um, you actually are charged with luring a child whether or not there's a child there, and it's not not just an attempt, but it's an actual luring charge, um, because the person believed they were luring a real child, um, and that that's where the difference is. Um, the, well, the, the simulated stuff, again, uh, hmm. it, even though it's done on a computer, it's really just a drawing, a painting. Um, there's no real children involved, um, and yeah. everybody knows that from the onset. Where the luring, the law was actually uh, crafted uh, to include. Um, uh, a person that they believed was a child um, at the time, whether or not that person is a child. And that law has been uh, challenged uh, for in, in Vermont on that and um, that has withheld the legal challenges. So, mm -hmm. so it's two, two completely separate, separate animals mm -hmm. there. I, I agree with Senator Berluf that this is I appreciate the effort here, and it's a big improvement. And um, it keeps coming in my mind as sexting, um, particularly if the uh, one of the children sexting is a minor, and the other one may be 16. How does that impact in this at all, or does it? That would not be implicated by this proposed change. That's, uh, if, if anything, um, it would be, it could potentially be more along the lines of the luring uh, a statute maybe. Um, uh, but we also have protections in other areas of the law so that we're not <clears throat> high school behavior, things like that. 
Um, but yeah, that, that would not be implicated by this proposed change. And, and I do want to thank Investigator Raymond for reminding me about the luring statute, which is where um, these, uh, the particular hypothetical that Senator Baruth brought up, that is where that's charged. And um, the luring statute does essentially criminalize what we would commonly think of as an attempt, although it does not um, phrase it that way. Um, oh, I appreciate uh, the effort here. And, and um, Matt, I appreciate the work that you put in um, every day. I, I always wonder how you do that. It's going to be very difficult to look at those depictions. But I note you have a beautiful dog behind you, sir. Yeah. Oops. He's a... Uh... He's actually an electronic detection dog that helps find the thumb drives and SD cards and stuff that we search for. So right now he's <laughs> snoring, hopefully not too loudly. No. Um, any other questions? Uh, Bryn, I know you're on board here. and I, I put in a drafting, I'll put in a drafting request for this, but it may be that the house takes it up first. And any other senator that wants to join me in that would be happy to have you on board. Just let me know. Senator Baru, Senator Lyon, Senator Hooker. So, and I, I, I put on, a, I put in a request as well um, on the House side, and so we yeah. can get out. And um, and uh, Representative Bird is also very interested in this as <coughs> uh, sponsor of the bill. Oh, yeah, it, it, it was one of those Zoom bills that. Um, it's unfortunate that we've seen an increase due to the pandemic and this behavior. And uh, so it was topic. It was a timely bill in my mind. Any other questions on that? I wonder, uh, Mike, if you could help us. Um, I know Matt's here. If we took a break until 11, if we could start up on the Johnson case. Um, with Matt and Jim Baker, if he's available at 11. We said 11.15, but Matt, are you, you're available at 11. Okay, great. Why don't we take a 15 minute break till 11 and uh, we're gonna start with Jim Baker and uh, Matt Valerio. The, the issue is the death of Mr. Johnson, who was an Howe's dad. Uh, offender who died. Um, there was an investigation done by Downs, Rack. I always get them mixed up. Downs, Racklin, and Martin, um, uh, former uh, federal prosecutor, Chris Coffin, who did the investigation along with someone else. Um, we asked Centurion to join us today to, um, their report is highly critical of Centurion, but they uh, decline to join us. So um, with that, I would turn it over to Jim Baker and uh, Mike has uh, put the uh, report on and maybe um, Jim, if specific areas of the report you want to go to, since I can't open it either. Uh, having technical difficulties here at the State House. Today. You know, Senator, I thought the way to address this is that, um, you know, um, I, I would go to the recommendations if that's okay. Can you go to the recommendations, Mike? I can. I, I'm not familiar with this report, so a page number would be helpful if you have it in front of you. But Mike, I think it's page 29 um, that starts the re recommendation conclusions, um, conclusion A. Here? Correct. Great. And then if you just direct me, I will navigate from there. Correct. So, so um, again, to, for the record, uh, my name is Jim Baker. I'm the interim commissioner of corrections. And um, so I, Senator, I think where I'll start is, is, is what I've said in the past. Um, this, I would consider um, Downs, Racklin, Martin's um, investigation, um, the administrative review um, of the incident involving Mr. Johnson. I've spoken to this many times, um, both here to the media and otherwise. And um, I'll, I'll say what I've said many times, that this death was preventable. Um, 
you know, this is one of many reports. Uh, Drivet did a report, Secretary of State's office did an investigation. The uh, Defender General's Office Prison Office of Prisoners' Rights did an investigation. Um, there was a medical review, uh, peer-to-peer medical review by Vermont Program for Quality Healthcare, Inc. State Police did an investigation, an untimely death investigation. Uh, the Orleans State's Attorney's Office uh, reviewed that investigation. And now we have um, the uh, investigation done by Downs, Rackland, and Martin. And, uh, and for the record, I think it's important that, um, that the committee knows that um, corrections cooperated 100% with uh, DRM. And, uh, and all the folks that they were interested in interviewed uh, were cooperated and, and were interviewed. Um, you know, I, I think for us, it was important that the investigation from the outside was done um, because of um, clarity and accountability. And, um, you know, the important, the important question for me as the commissioner is less about uh, what happened because, um, you know, I think through these investigations for me as the commissioner, I'm, I'm pretty clear on what happened. And uh, someone someone died, and I think the more important piece for me is um, what what is changing. And I think the recommendations break down, uh, the conclusions and recommendations break down to three principal sections: uh, medical, policy, and, and culture. And included in that culture is comments that are made by DRM about um, about. Uh, implicit bias training, and I'll, I'll touch on that in my comments about the things that were addressing, that were being addressed um, prior to the report, and have a renewed focus in the report. Um, the first, the first conclusion is that um, DOC officers and healthcare providers should have done more to help Mr. John, and um, I, I don't dispute that, nor should anybody in corrections dispute that, um, that um, things went wrong. And um, some of the things that we have focused on in the medical area to change is, um, you had mentioned earlier that the former contractor um, would not come um, to the committee, Centurion. We have changed contractors. Um, providing healthcare in a correctional setting is a challenge to begin with. And um, there's a lot of stuff that has come that has come out of this, that in areas that we're focused on. One of those areas are um, paying attention to acute care. Even though this particular report does not single this issue out, um, this is a theme that was unspoken in many of the reports that I picked up on, which is um, how we pay attention to the acute patients within our system those who require a higher degree of care and how they're seen within the facility and how they get that care outside the facility by specialists. And I think in Mr. Johnson's case, um, this was spoken to in other investigations, but um, getting to see a specialist um, has been a challenge in the past, getting people out of a facility to see them. And there's a, there's a new level of coordination with our new contractor, Vital Core, when it comes to that, to that effort. Um, there's also work being done on a daily basis with um, our part-time medical director and our, our medical team and working with Vital Corps. Um, I believe there's a better tracking right now of acute care patients in the system and a conversation daily on the status of those acute care um, patients. In fact, I just before getting back onto the Zoom meeting, I saw an email that came out about an acute care patient that I'm now included in those emails. And I, I can ask questions about the level of care that's going on there. We're working on a better level of communication between us and the healthcare provider with Vital Core having a leadership structure in the state now on the ground and uh, tracking of those acute care. And as I said, we have a part-time medical director now. Is that good enough? No. Um, but we've had a challenge trying to find a full-time medical director. 
and uh, we will continue to work on that. But um, having a part-time medical director in Dr. Scott Strenio has been a big step forward in the collaboration and the coordination of medical oversight of patients in the system. And um, you know, I'll, I'll come back to this later, but in this section of the report um, that leads up to this conclusion, there is conversations about um, the threat of discipline against Mr. Johnson by both the nursing staff and DOC staff. And um, I'll, I'll come back to that uh, a little bit uh, later when we talk about policy. The other thing I wanna point out is that we have opened up an office to deal with constituents and those constituents um, can be parents or loved ones that have general concerns about their loved ones in the system. But we spend quite a bit of time with folks that reach us about the medical care and um, well-being of um, folks in our custody in facilities. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to report that that office of constituency is doing a lot of work where we can chase down uh, information to make sure that um, concerns of loved ones um, are, are answered, but it's also uh, turning up and creating conversation amongst staff because there is a concern by a loved one. So I'm hoping over time that that becomes an uh, avenue for family members to advocate, just like someone to advocate for me, healthcare on the outside trying to create that same situation where there's advocacy for um, loved ones inside the system. So if, if uh, James, if you, if you move down, th those are um, some of the points as a result of the recommendation uh, in, in conclusion A. And if, if, we, if, we go, if we go to B. Before you go there, yes. um, Commissioner, I have a question, and it says that uh, Mr. Johnson was not transferred to a hospital, and um, which was a short distance away and should have been transferred. Right. When you discussed what we're going to do in the future, um, it would be interesting, important for the committee to understand why he wasn't transferred and how we can be assured that if a similar situation arose in the future that he would be transferred. Yeah, I was gonna to touch on that further. In. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize. Well, I'll, do it, I'll do it now, Senator, it's your question. Um, look, what I, got, what I gather from this is it goes to the cultural piece um, where um, sometimes there's a disbelief by staff and the medical staff when people present with complaints around medical. Um, and, you know, I think this came out clear in all the investigations that um, there, there is a certain amount that goes on inside the system where people try to get outside to go to, to uh, outside medical care. Um, and there's a belief within certain mindset within our system that, um, that, um, they, they are doing that to, to um, play the system. And that's a cultural thing. And it's, it's about the humanity um, as I've testified before. So when you ask that question about what are, what are we doing in the future, um, part of the review that we're doing of policy is right now it's confusing as DMR has stated in the report about can correctional staff overrule medical staff about making a decision to move people. And um, we, are, we are having an outside review of those policies now to try to determine what's the best policies around the country when it comes to how you manage those conversations inside a facility. I'm of the belief at the end of the day that I hold the superintendents of a facility accountable for what goes on in that facility. And they should have the final say in deciding what happens with an individual, even if a medical provider is, is advising against it. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. To the extent, yeah, I mean, I, I certainly understand it's a manipulative, manipulative group and we've talked about that in the previous. Correct, discussion. correct. On the other hand, 
uh, we can err on the side of caution. And I don't know, um, you know, he was 60 years old, was there on detention, um, and um, 60 is old to be incarcerated, I guess. Yes, it is. And uh, so all the signs were there. This wasn't a 20 year old um, presenting problems, otherwise healthy person. Yeah, and, and um, you know, you heard me say this before when I talked about this prior to the DMR report. You know, a review with video was hard to watch because um, I don't think you needed to be a medical professional to see um, how, how labored it was for Mr. Johnson um, to, to, to catch his breath. So I think um, in, in the future, and we, we've already talked about this short of waiting for a policy review, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, that um, I expect that the jail staff who are ultimately responsible for the safety of the individuals in the facility will weigh in more about what they believe should happen with an individual being taken out to an emergency room. Thank you. Is there any other questions on that piece about, um, you know, I'll just wrap this up by saying again, it's, um, it, you know, it's, it's obvious that enough was not done for Mr. Johnson. I mean, because he, uh, he lost, you know, he lost his life. Let me talk a little bit about um, uh, sections um, B and C around policy. Um, the first one talks about this very thing that um, we talked about, um, about the understanding of the role of the healthcare provider uh, and um, the corrections officers that are involved in providing security. And, um, you know, you know, we retain the services of the Moss Group, which is one of the leading firms in the country, uh, headed up by an individual by the name of Andy Moss, um, who, who was in, in an employee at one time with the Georgia Department of Corrections. And her, her consulting firm is one of the leading think tanks in the country on best policies. Um, they have been helping Moss, or excuse me, they've been helping DMR with the Chittenden review, and uh, we've engaged them to help us with several things. And I won't go through all of those, but one of them is um, immediate priority is to take a look at these policies that guide this conversation right here and provide us with input and create new policies for us to implement. And we're doing it from the outside um, in because I, I feel like we need an outside set of eyes on this um, because it's easy to fall back to old thinking. And in my mind, it's a way to break the thinking around the way we've done business in the past. So Moss has been involved. And in this is uh, a lot of conversations about the issue of segregation. And, uh, you know, we, we've, uh, since this incident, we've, we have uh, enhanced our segregation reports monthly, which much more detail and much more follow up that we provide, not only internally to, to myself and other leaders in the organization, but we publish that um, on our website. And um, what well, used to be just a graph of what the segregation for the month was and what type of segregation it is, is a company with much more detail now. And I'm briefed on a monthly basis. And in at least one case in the last two months, I picked up on a situation of data that um, I think could have led um, uh, could have led to inequity in the system around an individual who was transgender. And so that's one area that we've worked on. Um, we, we've, we've also um, shifted the oversight of the healthcare. Um, to a deputy, to the deputy commissioner, and the deputy commissioner now is the point of contact. Um, for the lack of better term, um, I, I would see deputy commissioner Hankin as the CEO of the hospital with a medical director, because again, a twenty million dollar healthcare system requires a lot of oversight, and um, we've elevated that 
to the level of uh, Deputy Commissioner Hankin having oversight over that. And we are in the process of, of reviewing those policies and in particular around the segregation piece. And um, there, there was a lot of confusion in the interviews between staff members about uh, segregation and what you can use that for. And I'll go on the record right now uh, as the commissioner, the sitting commissioner, to say that segregation um, is not a tool that should be used to coerce people into doing any into doing something um, that is not in their best interest. Um, segregation is a tool we have to use inside the facilities, but in this case, um, the misbelief that Mr. Johnson was manipulating led to threats of segregation. And um, when you read all the various reports, um, it, it's, it's hard to read this stuff. And so the piece around segregation is a big part of what I'm paying attention to now. Um, we're doing the policy review on it, and we're gonna clarify and make sure that staff understands when it's appropriate um, to talk about segregation with an inmate in our custody. And the last piece um, that came out, I can't remember if it's in this section or not, um, is, is the observation process of an inmate that's being observed for medical reasons. You know, there's three levels of that. Um, constant supervision, someone staying with them all the time with eyes on, 15 minutes and 30 minutes. And um, there's confusion in the interviews about who can elevate that observation period. But more for me um, that I found troubling was that when the observation was made, and in this case, to the credit of the staff, the observations were made within the policy's time, 30 minutes, but the documentation um, was woolfully inaccurate, in, inaccurate on the documentation. So for example, at one point an entry said that Mr. Johnson was awake. And when you looked at the video, it was clear that Mr. Johnson was struggling with his breathing. So that's, that's a, a piece of the policy that needs to be adjusted. So Senator, I'm gonna stop there to see if there's any questions. I have a couple of questions that arise, but I don't know if they're this part of the, hard to follow which part of the uh, report, but the fact that Mr. Uh, Johnson was a person of color and given the nature of the crime that he was charged with, is, it, is that a factor in all this? Um, you know, anecdotally, um, um, you, did, you know, did the report, or is that later in the report? It is. It is addressed by DMR, DR, DRM um, yeah. later. Later in the report, um, and it is addressed in the body of the report, and that's part of the recommendations around both uh, training for implicit, in, implicit bias, <coughs> excuse me, and around the issues of culture. So. What I'll say to that Senator now is, is that, you know, the nature of what Mr. Johnson was being held on um, was the nature of an allegation of a crime that inside a facility, not only by the inmate population, but by sometimes by others, that is seen as um, not high, high regard. And then you have the fact that Mr. Johnson was African American. I, I don't, you know, I, I can't get inside someone's mind and I can't say with certainty that that played into this, but on the other side, just as a reporter says, you can't rule it out either. I mean, it was interesting that <coughs> at least one of the staff members was not aware of the concept of implicit bias. Other staff members were. And there were actual staff members working that night that were of color. And so um, I can't say with certainty that that played into it, but I don't think you can take it off the table. And I think it's in our best interest to really start focusing in on um, raising the conversation and the awareness and the training of our staff around equity. And I'll address that when we get to that section on implicit bias and culture. Does that, does that help, Senator? Helps. It's just that. 
uh, continually throughout, you know, just a review of what little part of the report that we have in front of us need additional training, need additional training. And, and, uh, clearly that that's part of it, but it's also this, the factors, um, let's put it this way, Mr. Johnson had everything going against him, a person of color, the crime that he was alleged to have committed, the age, et cetera. I, I agree with you, Senator. And I, I think um, I'll make this point again, and I'm gonna make it now. Um, I have a fair amount of experience in my career dealing around implicit bias and how you bring that awareness, education, and mindset shift within an agency. And it takes much more than training to do that. It's, um, it's a cultural shift. I, and I'm not, I don't mean to be preachy, but I just wanna make that point now and I'm gonna make the point again, because uh, in, in the review, once DRM had did their report, um, Secretary Smith and I um, chatted about this and chatted with DMR about it. And um, it's important to understand that you know, you can do an implicit bias training for all the staff, you know, do an hour online training about implicit bias and check the box off that you did the training, but that's not the cultural shift that needs to occur. And it's, and it's more than just racial bias. Um, as I told you, I picked up on something reviewing seg reports around uh, a, a transgendered individual. And so it's more than, it's more than just um, race, but you, in this case, I agree that Mr. Johnson had a lot going against him, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions regarding these sections? Um, I do have a question or- Yeah, Senator uh, Lyons. Yeah, thanks. Um, so it's, it's clear that you've identified a distinction between some of the medical process and policies. So the nurse didn't know when she or he uh, should be um, making recommendations uh, and also on segregation. And so it seems to me that, at, and we've talked about this before, uh, uh, a, a better <laughs> integrated uh, system of care for inmates. And do the inmates have, I mean, you don't have to answer this, but as we look at that, will they have um, a primary care so that the nurse uh, have, has a regular contact or the physician has a regular contact with patients so they get to know the patient? And I know that's hard because people are going in and out, but at some point that becomes really critical, uh, especially when you see something like this where there's an acute need. Uh, so on the medical side, having that system in place uh, for primary care and then being able to hand off. And then just one other comment, and that is you mentioned families being involved and more involved and people outside being more involved. Do inmates ever at any point have, um, well, this sound, probably, might not sound like something they would, they would do on a regular basis, I agree which would be like an advanced directive or some kind of act, uh, identification of individuals who can uh, weigh in when there is this kind of an acute um, issue. Let, let, I'll try to answer all of that for you, Senator. Let me go back and just say, this situation in my mind was not about if the nurse didn't know if they could send someone out or not. I think this was more about what Senator Sears framed it earlier about um, the underlying belief that there's a level of manipulation that happens in the system. Um, they had full power um, and, and, and I, I confuse you reports now, but I do think it's in this report that um, a medical director was contacted. It's, it's, about the, um, it's about the coordination between security staff, corrections officers, and, and nursing staff about when to move someone in a medical crisis, right? And that for us has to be worked on at a level of communication and understanding for our leadership team at the facilities. The next point is that absolutely what we're trying to do inside corrections and are we there yet? No, we're not. And I've said this before, people know that um, some folks 
on, on this hearing know that I faced some medical challenges in my life and uh, I received some of the best care in the world. And that's why I'm still here. And uh, I believe, I believe that um, the folks that are inside our system for $20 million a year should, should be getting the same level of community care. So the standard we measure against and Dr. Strenio and I have had this conversation several times since he's come on as our part-time medical director. The expectation is that the folks that are in our custody get a level of care that's comparable to the community care. The next point is what I, what I said earlier, which probably wasn't clear because I didn't say it the way you asked the question, Senator, but one of the things that is happening now is, is something that wasn't happening before with our prior um, uh, care provider. And, and I, I think it's daily calls. I could be every, could be three times a week, but anyway, there is a list of, um, Vital Core has gone through the system and identified those patients that are, um, are most acute. And there's a daily or, or three times a week phone call with both our staff and vital core staff going over what is the situation with each one of those patients. And that, that list is, is not huge, it's small, but it's a level of communication that was not happening before this incident. So um, I, I think what I'm trying to say to you is, is that they don't get a nurse assigned to them, but um, the nurses understand what the situation is with inmates. What was missing before, I think, is the level of over... Nurses operate at a certain level, as we all know, and doctors are at a different level. And um, I think what we have now is a better communication with the medical directors about uh, the acute nature of, 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 the, of the patients. And then the final piece is there are situations where there is uh, medical directives or power of attorney or permission for loved ones to talk to us. But if we don't have permission, we can't provide, just like any other medical, you call the hospital about a friend, you're not gonna get information. If we don't have a release on, on file, we don't release information. But, you, but they can designate folks who are, are their power of attorney. And, 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 I'll, <clears throat> and I'll end that comment by saying, in fact, we're dealing with a situation like this now an end of life care. And we tried to get the individual out of the system into uh, hospice type care. And um, this is a situation where this individual, because of the nature of their crime that they were convicted of, had pretty much burned all their family bridges and didn't have anybody. And those are the most difficult cases for us to deal with. And we're dealing with one right now that um, I, I said earlier, I got an email just before um, I got back on Zoom about this situation with this patient. And so there is that level of um, tie into the families. Thank you. Good. I only see a few people on the screen, but Senator Baruth, did you have a question? Any other questions? Okay, um, Commissioner, go ahead. Um, Conclusion D is another, um, I, I touched on this about the training to understand between um, communication process. There's confusion in the report by the supervisor on duty, how many times they spoke to um, the superintendent at the time, and the superintendent has a different recognition, a, a recollection of that. And again, I'm not casting any um, uh, I'm not casting any uh, opinions on that, but clearly we have to do a better job of having a point of, the point, the tip of the spear about who the final decision maker is on a situation like Mr. Johnson's. And um, that'll be part of the policy review. If, if James, if you move to 30, page 37. Sorry, I should have told you to move earlier. I, I apologize to the committee for that.
this is the peace center series you brought up earlier about um, about DLC should impl implement implicit bias training. Um, this comes as a result of the interviews that um, Downs, Racklin, and Martin did with staff, and at least one of the staff members um, professed that they did not know what implicit bias was. Um, that's troubling to me, but that's really why we did this review, this nature to understand these issues. And so um, their recommendation is, is that um, we implement implicit bias training. And uh, I take that recommended recommendation seriously, but I'm gonna say what I said earlier. In order to uh, integrate equity into the system, it's gotta be more than just implicit bias training. And um, I'll remind you of some of the work that was done around Senate Bill 24 in the last session that we worked um, with um, House Corrections and Institutions to shape language as it made through the various committees. The idea behind that working with HCI on the House side was, um, I, I think we were in the forefront of saying to the committee that we wanted a framework um, to force the conversation and force us to create situations that went beyond training and uh, when it comes to equity in the system. And we've already introduced implicit bias training into our recruit class. The last two classes that have gone through, we've implemented implicit bias training that's being provided to us by uh, Tabitha Moore. And um, that's, a, that's a day long uh, uh, presentation and uh, kind of an interesting side story. The last class that um, Ms. Moore provided that to, um, she was driving home, we got a flat tire on a, on a kind of a desert, desert section of Marshfield. And one of the recruits in the class came along. Um, and I, I tell you this because there's several pieces to it. Several cars passed by her. As, as all of you know that Tabitha is a person of color. And uh, this one car stops and uh, picks up Miss Moore, and helps her get the tire changed. And as it turns out, it was one of the recruits in the, uh, in the class. And uh, the recruit brought up how powerful it was, um, her training that day um, during the eight hours. And you know, it's the kind of Vermont story that you can't make up that happens. So I bring that up because it is, it is an impactful training and we're starting it with our recruits and we do have plans um, to move uh, uh, training throughout the organization. My, my charge to the Office of Professional Standards is I, I, they need to find the training that we can implement fairly quickly that's not checked off the box and it's not a one-time thing. It's a base setting for the conversation inside corrections around implicit bias. So um, that's, that's what's, ha what's happening there. Um, any questions about um, implicit bias training? And, and I have find myself muted. Um, right. Go ahead, Representative Emmons, I think. Is. I'm intrigued, Commissioner, when you said about the implicit bias training, you can have the training, but that doesn't mean it corrects the problem. Or how do you deal with the pressure of coworkers, your colleagues, your coworkers? Because that's where it really comes from. You know, Representative, I, I was, I was, I was hoping you were still on because I think you were at the Print Executive Committee meeting on Friday. Yes, I was. There was, there was a defining moment in that conversation that I want to bring you back to, and I'll share with the committee. The union representative to the Print Executive Committee called out that um, he is starting to understand the issue of humanity inside our system. Uh, and I'm paraphrasing what he said, if you remember this. That to me was a defining moment. And so part of, of the work that we're doing on cultural change is not only the work that we're doing with Moss, but it's the print project. And for, for folks that, um, just to refresh your memory, this is the print prison prison research and innovation work that we're doing in Springfield. And it's, it's funded by the Arnold Ventures Foundation and our partners, our research partners are UVM. And um, we work with the Urban Institute. And there's an executive committee that oversees this, which Representative Edmonds is a, is a member of that executive committee. And the union is represented there. And uh, 
it, it was a defining moment, I thought, the other day. Um, I, I kind of had a long week last week, and um, it ended my week uh, realizing that all the hard work we're doing is starting to set in. So I say all of that, Representative Edmonds, because um, I'm a firm believer in, uh, in, in Malcolm Gladwell's work, um, Tipping Point. And um, I think what you saw the other day is a concept that Gladwell talks about in his book, which is conveyors of the message. And I think what happened is that that representative from the union is the conveyor of the message. And um, he's holding on. I, I, I speak to him once in a while. He holds me accountable in our conversations. But I, I think your point is well taken that um, I believe what I've seen in other organizations primarily with police organizations, but I don't think it's any different here. And my work that I did nationally in this area, what you see happen is, is you, you provide training and input and, and opportunities for conversations and the conversations break out and eventually the, the culture tips as a result of more and more people being aware of what their prejudice, their biases and prejudices may be and how it affects the operation of the system. So that's what Moss is helping us with. That's what the Print Project is all about. And um, we are providing opportunities to have these tough conversations. Does that help, Representative? Yes, thank you. Any, Senator, any questions for me on, on the implicit no, bias? Any other questions on the, on those sections? Okay. Jim, you could go down to the to the bottom of the section on, on, on a culture of respect and dignity. And I really think um, I, 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 I've covered this. I think, Senator, this goes back, Senator Sears, this goes back to your comment earlier about what Mr. Johnson had going against him. You know, the nature of his offense, um, the fact that he was African-American and that he's 60 years old. And we know that a 60 year old in a correctional system um, isn't really representative health-wise of um, what 60 is. And um, this, this issue around respect and dignity um, is the stuff that we're working on, as I said, through Moss, Prin, and the conversations that we're having internally on a regular basis with staff around the issues of dignity and respect. And I will also finish this by saying, this issue of dignity and respect goes to other conversations I've had with this committee and, and house corrections and institutions around retention of employees. It goes hand in hand. And so it doesn't matter if, it, if you're showing uh, the lack of dignity and respect to a new staff member, or if you're showing a lack of dignity and respect to an inmate, um, it all has negative outcomes. And um, we, we, have to, we have to change that. And we're working on that through our efforts with Moss and Prim. Senator, those are the comments I had, and uh, yeah. I'm certainly open for. Well, the more you know, and I read the report earlier, <clears throat> but trying to go over it now, the more, the more you read, uh, the more concerned you get. Of why? I mean, the, the man was on the floor in the bathroom, and mm -hmm. they still don't call for outside help. I, it just um, inexplicable, uh, and obviously we're not going to get an answer from Centurion. Um, yeah, Senator, I think um, I've said that it's hard to fake lying on the bathroom floor. But I think also, Senator, if you were to see the video, it's also hard to fake um, the trouble that he had catching his breath. Mm -hmm. the distress he was under. Correct. And I'm not not here to defend it. I'm here to tell you that, um, you know, in your, in your professional working career, there's certain things that you encounter that leave a lasting impression on you. And this is one of them. And I, there's, I, I, again, I don't want to make this case simplistic because it's not, but it's not as complicated. It, it's, not in, it's not as complicated about how he ended up passing. What's complicated is why certain things happen. And the best I can do right now as the commissioner is to change processes 
around the policies, the culture, our relationship with our with our healthcare provider, and um, make, make an awareness that there's a difference between manipulation and when someone's in distress. Yeah. Um, other questions for Commissioner uh, Baker, uh, Representative Hooper. Yeah. Uh, and after we hear from Matt, uh, hopefully, Jim, you're going to stay on line. And if there's questions for either one of you afterwards, you can ask. I'm, I'm, I'm here, Senator, till you're done with the subject, sir. So. Great. Yeah. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, thank you. Um, I understand and appreciate and admire the um, challenges and the commitment to instituting change within an organization and how tremendously difficult this is within an organization of the nature of the Department of Corrections. I, I get it philosophically. Um, I understand intellectually what, what is being accomplished. I'm, I just continue to be really concerned that we are not addressing this as urgently as needs to be done. And, and Commissioner, boy, I get it. You're on it every day. You are trying to, you are urgently addressing it. The, the concern I have is, is that if I'm a, a CO1 in some, one of our facilities and I hear I'm going to get training, um, I, I, I've been trained on bunches of stuff and, you know, and so what? Or, or yay, good stuff happens. But when something as horrendous as this happened, and I don't see kind of the consequence of change immediately or close to immediately. Why? Why does the training matter? I mean, I, you, do you understand what I'm trying to say? I need to see a consequence, and I get the change culture, but there's no. I, I don't see it happening. And so how do I become invested and committed to that change unless I see the consequences? You know, Representative, you and I have had this conversation. Yeah. Um, um, and I, I, don't, I don't wanna make this sound personal for me, but um, um, you know, I'm doing 12, 14 hours a day trying to turn yeah. this shit. I, please let me finish because I, I want to make this point. Um, this is not my first um, fix-it job. And um, I, I will tell you that, um, and I had this conversation with someone on Friday who why they were attending what I described happened at the print meeting. I cannot emphasize to you what a game changer that was. And I had somebody that from the advocacy community email me during that, that individual making that statement say to me, wow, I, 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 I can't believe um, the change that's happening because it isn't, I, I hear that you want a consequential cha change, but culture that's entrenched in an organization and, and there's so much going on. I said this earlier when we were talking about reinvestment. There's so much going on that, um, my experience at change in organization is all of a sudden you wake up one day and you say to yourself, how did you get there? Because it's every day putting your shoulder to the grind and, and pushing as hard as you can forward. I will tell you, and I would encourage you because I, I, I would encourage you to talk to some other staff around you and ask them about how fast change is happening inside corrections. And I, you know, that's the best I can do because because otherwise it's going to make it sound like I'm just pushing you off. I'm not. It's, it's, it's a, it, it is a, it is a long process. The problem with this situation is, is that Mr. Johnson should not have died. And he did. And I, I, I wish I, you know, I wish I could have something I could say that would change that, but I can't. All I can do is look at these circumstances and I pretty much, understand this 
this situation inside out. And the changes we're making are not only addressing what happened to him, but the issues about the way we look at inmates, the way we treat them, threatening someone with segregation because they're not compliant on something that relates to your health care. Now, if they're not compliant because they're being given an order to do something um, in violation of the rules is a different story, but not around health care. That, that, so, so these changes are happening and all I ask you to do is be patient. Thank you, and, and I, I, I know that I am being impatient. It is not challenging your theory or not... practice. I just, I, I, and you've only been with us for a year, but sadly, you know, we have been hearing, we're working on this. I, I've been here for 12 years. And I hear this, um, and I can't hold you accountable for, you can for that. It. But I just, the fact that somebody could die under these circumstances in today's society is appalling. And um, I am fearful that we are not accomplishing the change that is necessary. As, as hard as you are working and your team is working, I'm just, so I am impatient and I, I, forgive I, I, me I, for it slopping over on you and, and, and others, but it- your, your job is to hold me accountable representative yeah. and I don't mind that at all. Yeah. That's part of why I'm here. Uh, all yeah. I'm saying is, is that um, I know you related to me the story of when your son was growing up and what you used to tell him about it. I think you said about a B plus, right? You're, you're, you're looking for, I get it. I understand. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I want, the, I, I want the A from the, I, I want us to position our frontline staff so that they can get A's. Yeah. Well, listen, Not, can, yeah. can I, can I just finish this point? Cause I, I always, I always forget to say this, especially the environment we're in right now. I am so incredibly proud of what the people in corrections do every day. This, put the Johnson thing aside for a minute. What they walk into every day, Springfield facility retested on Friday, completely negative. That just doesn't happen. And, you know, what we're doing every day to keep people safe, this situation is not good, but it's not, it's, it's not the majority of the staff in corrections. In fact, what I find when I talk to them, some of them may have a tough exterior because they have to, but when you get into it with them, they really do care. My job is to support them. Sometimes they feel like they don't get a level of support. It's not, it's not a glorious job. They don't pull people out of burning buildings like firefighters or respond to car accidents and save people at the scene. It's not the nature of what the job is. It's behind the scenes of what they do every day. And so I have to say this publicly because sometimes I forget to say it. Um, the vast majority of the people working inside corrections are incredible human beings that are working right now under some very trying circumstances with the pandemic being what it is. So uh, I'm gonna leave it at that because I'm taking airtime away from other people. So. The report that we received from um, in the Joint Fiscal Committee, perhaps as timely as well, um, regarding the retention of uh, staff and the problems there. I, I think it's it's more than you know, it's a, it's a, there are problems with set with the low wages, the retention of staff, the working conditions, and, so, and you know the compounds itself because you can't the more you when you have such turnover and churn in staff that means people are working overtime uh, mandatory overtime uh, and so forth and so on so, um, but uh, if are there any other questions of the commissioner right now if not we go to uh, Matt Valerio the defender general who's been patiently waiting um, and thank you Matt uh, thanks for having me again. 
you know, I don't have a lot to say about uh, about this. The commissioner and I have had numerous conversations um, as our as the Defender General's report um, was was being developed and ultimately uh, came out on this. And I don't find any of the findings in the Downs Rackland Martin report to be um, notably different than what uh, what my office uh, found. There are different shades to or emphasis in, in certain areas and the like, but uh, I didn't frankly anticipate that it was going to be particularly different. Um, you know, this this situation is, is one that regrettably um, situations like this um, don't often result in death, um, but over a period of uh, now me doing this job almost 20 years, um, I've seen it many times in my office, one of the, since uh, the litigation about good time went away years ago, um, arguments, litigation regarding uh, provision of medical care um, is the number one thing that we deal with. Uh, and one of the things that the commissioner and I have talked about is try to break down the sort of litigious nature of the way disputes over medical care are dealt with. Um, and I think that some of there are some very subtle things that the department has done um, that aren't, I think, apparent on its face um, regarding medical care um, since this incident um, and uh, with the commissioner's uh, assistance um, that have gone into place. And one of those things is that the, the uh, medical grievances are treated in a completely different way. Um, in the past, medical grievances were going to be resolved by people who had no medical training whatsoever. They were sort of the person assigned at any given time to be handling grievances of all varieties. Um, now they are being forwarded through um, a medical review. Um, and then I believe to the commissioner himself, um, ultimately, uh, to deal with the uh, the biggest disputes. Um, when we, when my office does litigation regarding medical concerns, it's, you know, the traditional path is that the, the inmate files a lawsuit and sometimes they file it before the grievance situation is over. They don't follow the correct steps and DOC legal is all over that as a normal quote unquote normal grievance would get caught up in the red tape of um, the grievance process and the when it got to court, you would not have exhausted your um, administrative remedies before you get to court. The, the case had a chance of being dismissed. Um, even if everything was done the right way, once it's in court, it's gonna take at least six to nine months from the time the case is filed to get to the point where a court might be able to schedule to make a decision um, and oftentimes at that point, DOC legal would just dismiss the case on their own and the person would get whatever it is that they were asking for um, six, nine, 12 months earlier. Um, the hope is that with the change in the way the grievance process relative to medical um, care is being dealt with now by the department, um, that we are going to avoid um, some good number of that sort of activity um, and the commissioner has said to me, if there is a particular case or if there are particular issues where, you know, you're getting the typical kind of uh, lawyer response to uh, litigation to contact him and I will do that. And I have done that um, on occasion. And uh, we try to get these things resolved before they get to the point of, of, uh, of litigation. Um, that in and of itself is such a massive change in culture, um, but it's culture from the very top um, that it is uh, almost unheard of. Um, but, uh, you know, honestly, I, it's, it's about having those relationships that allow you to do that. Um, the, uh, the issues that arise regarding um, implicit bias, racial bias, um, and uh, how we treat individuals, no matter the charge, um, relative to medical issues and just in general, 
uh, when they are in facilities, it's going to be a, a massive nut to crack. Um, there have been a number of studies um, recently about implicit bias and its impact on behavior of law enforcement and the like over the last couple of years, because obviously it's been a hot button item everywhere. Um, and you know, the study that was done in New York City showed that they spent a lot of money having a lot of training and it changed no behavior whatsoever. Um, and there was a similar study done in Missouri. Um, the bottom line is that when it comes right down to it, oftentimes uh, biases and the like to be resolved, you have to actually change people. Um, it takes a long time to, to, to shift the, the mentality of a culture of an organization. Um, I had my struggles early on with the Defender General's office in certain areas. And I know anybody who comes in to attempt to change the culture of a, a long-standing large organization in the Department of Corrections, uh, I think would be one of those. Um, the commissioner has a monumental task, but it's the kind of thing that you chip away at incrementally um, and it takes a long period of time. I don't, it's not the kind of thing you can say, look, we just did a massive implicit bias training we, and, we, and we just fixed it. Now everything's good. Um, it's the kind of thing that has to take place over a very long period of time with multiple reinforcements and changes in the people who are involved in the system. Um, you know, they, they talk about, uh, I, you know, one of my majors in, in college involved uh, was, was political science, but with a focus on public administration. And one of the things they talked about is that it might take 11 years for an organization to fully change an entrenched bureaucracy's culture. Um, and um, I always thought that was crazy until I got into working in bureaucracy and saw how it worked. Um, and uh, I think it, it's gonna take a long time. It may not take 11 years, it might take 20 years, uh, but, it, but uh, it's the kind of thing you have to persistently reinforce expectations over a very long period of time. Um, and it's, it's not just about race. It's not just about religion or sexual orientation or, um, you know, in Vermont, we even have a bias about people who aren't from Vermont. Uh, and that carries over uh, into facilities as well. Um, and it is, uh, uh, it's one of those things that uh, is, is going to be very difficult to get at. But I, I think the only way we can do it is to continually um, work on it. Some of the structural changes that the commissioner has made um, since this Johnson report, um, I think have been paying, paying some dividends. And, you know, obviously there's been a, and I will say has been a, a very big change in uh, how uh, the medical provider uh, that we currently have has dealt with the prisoner's rights office and in my office in general um, regarding uh, open, openness and transparency. Um, and ease of getting information and uh, understanding what's going on. Um, you know, I had been concerned and I am always going to be on, uh, uh, you know, kind of on guard for the fact that uh, uh, there will be resistance to us attempting to get information. And if that ends up being the case, I'll be here complaining about it and I'll be with Commissioner Baker complaining about it. Um, I do, frankly, hope that he hangs around long enough to see some of this through. I, I, you know, I'm mindful of the fact that he was interim chief of police in Rutland for six years or something. Uh, and, uh, you know, that might be half the time necessary to deal with the uh, uh, issues that he's got to deal with in corrections. But, you know, those who have been around long enough, um, you know, go back to the Carriger case and go back to the... Uh, you know, seven suicides in 18 months that we had in the early 2000s. Um, and, you know, and various incidents in between, and now we are where we are. Um, but these are recurring themes that if we don't keep our, uh, the pressure on, um, are liable to recur and do recur. Uh, so I'm hoping uh, that uh, 
you know, and I and I have good feelings about how we're going right now with it, but I'm hoping that this is the kind of thing that um, does not get lost in the shuffle. I, I will say that regard to the COVID situation, I am happily surprised that we don't have more incidents of uh, self-harm, uh, more incidents of uh, medical concerns that are not even related to COVID because COVID has come so high on the list of priorities that uh, other types of things are have necess almost necessarily been pushed down on the list of priorities. And I'm, I'm very concerned about the use of uh, segregation to deal with COVID, but it's almost no way that you uh, you can avoid it and prevent it from getting into the facilities at times. Um, I, I do wonder, however, over a long period of time, the type of damages this is going to do uh, emotionally and not just to uh, uh, inmates, but also to the staff who are dealing with them because you know that's, a, that's an interaction, that's a society in and of itself within those facilities. Um, it, this, this is a, uh, you know, the effectively combat, a combat type situation within those facilities relative to this virus and that having that sort of pressure over a long period of time with segregation being one of the ways, and, and I'm not talking about segregation for purposes of disciplinary matters, but over a very long period of time um, is liable to manifest itself in a lot of long-term problems. Um, and uh, I don't know all of the answers to this, um, but relative to the medical care as a whole, I think we have some structures in place that are better now than they were. Um, I don't have major, and as I said, I don't have major disagreements because with the report um, that Don Rackland did, because it basically mirrors what, what our report said, uh, while we might have been more, um, you know, hot on particular issues, the issues are just as identified in the in the Downs Rackland report as they are in ours. Um, and I, I think some steps have been made. And it's just how long can we persist and carry on to get sh make sure we get the job done on a long term basis. So if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer or if the commissioner has um, any questions. Well, it's, there's so much that it's hard to focus, um, but one of the things that's clear in the report is <clears throat> for whatever reason, and I don't have the advantage of having seen the videos. I don't know if you have. Oh yeah, I have. How could you miss it? That's, yeah. I guess that's the question from what Jim was, uh, Mr. Baker was describing. And what. No, you, this is the kind of thing you, I mean, I've been watching death scene videos and the like for the first half of my career and then watching these types of videos in the second half of my career. And, um, you know, they're the kind of things that haunt you. Um, you. You don't believe me. You don't want to have to watch this if you if you if you can avoid it. Just trust us. It's not. It's it's horrific. Um, but uh, how you can miss it? I, I mean, how can you think it's a manipulation? I mean, I I remember you know having kids say that they were hurt when I was two oh four. You know, and where they weren't there, we took them. You know, we erred on the side of caution and took them to the hospital, even when we didn't believe there was anything wrong. And sometimes there was something really wrong. Um, you know, it, it's, um, but I, I was, you know, in reading the report and Jim's comments about it, all the, and your just comments about it. And when I go back to Mary and the consequences, you know, I guess that's my big question is how do we make sure this doesn't happen again? So Senator, I think um, I, I am uh, the only explanation I can give you is, is culture. Um, you know, if you convince yourself, you know, I mean, put it in the bigger context of what's going on in the world right now around what's reality and what's not reality. 
and culture drives um, people's belief systems. And um, being, um, you know, again, I don't want to overplay what happened on Friday, but I got to say it again. <clears throat> when you start changing people's minds, they start looking at things different. And the suspicion that, um, you know, you know uh, there's a manipulation going on, you've convinced yourself of it. Um, I, I, I can't explain it. All I can do, all I can do is, is, you know, you're, you're, you heard Matt talk about the conversations we have and, um, you know, I, I don't have a high level of tolerance for if someone needs medical care, you know, you, you know, my situation center, I'm a, I'm a blessed guy. Everybody should have that same privilege. And so, um, to litigate, you know, as Matt said, it may be subtle to all of you, but it's a big deal that we're not gonna force them to litigate for six, eight, eight months, a medical situation needs to be taken care of now. It's those kind of things that start changing people's thinking around the way we interact with the, the inmate population. So I, I, don't, I don't have an explanation for it. I, I wish I did, I don't. And I don't- you know, one, of the think, but, one of the things about the change, and you, you seem much more confident with vital is it vital? Vital core. Vital core um, than with Centurion. But one of the one of the comments that we heard earlier on was it's the same staff, same nurses, same uh, it's not, is it or is that? Three three of the four nurses that were involved in this no longer work there. But I, I don't I don't want to talk for purse, you know. Um well, awesome. let me just be clear about you know our experience with vital core in um, what are we on? We're, we're heading into uh, we're heading into December, so we're talking five months, 150 days. You know, our experience to date has been positive, but there's still challenges in the system that need to be worked out. Um, but I think you know Matt talks about what he's really talking about is under the prior system, the healthcare, the health system administrators at each facility would run his staff around when they needed information. And I'm not speaking for you, Matt, but I think this is what we were talking about. And I put the word out that if, if they need information and they have a right to have the information under the statute, then get it to them. Stop making them litigate for it. And if there's something in that system or something in that conversation in the system that's not getting the proper medical care, and if they're not getting the response they should get in their role as the prisoner's rights office, then I need to know about it. And I think Matt stepped in a couple of times and, you know, I sent the word out, get this straightened out. Thank you. Other questions for either Matt or Representative Shaw? Thank you, Senator. So for either Matt or uh, Commissioner Baker. So I think you touched on it uh, just a moment ago, uh, Commissioner, about your contractor. Uh, so you said, I think I heard you say three of the four people that were involved in this situation are no longer with you. But it's also my understanding that most of the staff, I'll generalize that as most of the staff that was working for the previous contractor is now working for the current contractor. How do you bring your contractor along uh, with the various training uh, scenarios that you're talking about within DOC and assure uh, yourself and, and us and others that our medical contractor is properly uh, schooled in the various policies and procedures and trainings that DOC requires? Well, I, let, let me make a comment first. I, I'm not sure if most of the staff is still working. There is some staff, but the leadership team is entirely different. So it, at my level, in, dealing, in fact, I, I have a meeting with Vital Corps this afternoon to go over some issues that, that I'm concerned about. And, and again, I'll, I'll take it up with them to give them a chance to fix it. Um, I think the difference at that level is, is that um, because we have a deputy commissioner focused in on it, the message to Vital Corps is very clear since the beginning. And I use the Johnson case as a benchmark about the things that we need to work together on to provide a level of community care that they deserve. Now, when it comes to the training piece, 
we've already sat in on trainings they've done, and I would expect we'll do the same thing with their staff um, when it comes time to sit in on that training. Um, but I, I'm real hesitant just to put training out there because of what I said earlier. It's not, tr training is an awareness to me. The real hard work is down um, changing the outlook of the employees. So it takes collaboration and conversation. And it's unique because we have six different facilities with six different sets of staff and they're decentralized just like we are. So it's those relationships and joint, uh, joint conversations and training together that we're all on the same page. So is your contractually bound to provide uh, or follow your guidance, uh, I guess? I um, or is it, are they just doing it out of the kindness of their heart? I, I, I can't say, I don't know, because I'm not that familiar with the contract, but I, I don't see, I, I've never run up against any resistance in any conversations that I've had with them since July. Okay. So should they be uh, bound? Um, you know, I, I don't know, because I, I, you, I'll accept you, got, I don't. You, you got me on that one, Representative. I can't. Okay. All right. Thank you. I want, I, want, I want to mark this day down that Representative Shaw caught me speechless. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, other questions for the commissioner of comments? Senator Hooker. Thank you. Um, uh, something that Matt said piqued my curiosity. Uh, he talked, Matt, about uh, segregation and especially now in the time of COVID and what effects it might have. And so my, commission, uh, my question to you, Commissioner, is, is there a difference between the isolation that's disciplinary and the isolations that is um, related to COVID? Um, you know, Matt, I think what Matt's referring to, right, and what you're referring to, Senator, is, is that, you know, the reason why we were concerned about Springfield was there, there was an arrest made last weekend, um, a pretty violent arrest, someone um, high on drugs, and a, very, a, a lot of people came in contact, came into the system. We isolate them. When they come in, test them, use positive. So that system of isolating people prevent it from spreading. I think Matt would argue that it really doesn't look much different when we medic or we uh, isolate people coming into the system and we segregate people because we're keeping them separated from the rest of the population and no interaction. And Matt's points about, uh, I'm as concerned as he is and we spend a lot of time with Vital Core talking about the mental health services provided. If there's an area where I feel like we need to do more work is the mental health piece. Um, so isolating them, I think Matt's point, I'm not speaking for him, certainly can speak for himself, but I think what he's saying is it's just because of the nature of how we isolate people coming into the system for 14 days, it's a long time, is does take a toll on people. Now with segregation, I'm starting to pay closer attention to segregation because being new into the system, it just didn't register with me the significance of it. And in the last couple of months, it started registering with me, especially now that we have this, this report in front of us. So segregation for disciplinary purposes is treated a little bit different, but in essence, it's the same thing. They're isolated from the rest of the population. And we're, you know, they're no different than you and I. We're social creatures, right? Social interaction is important. Yeah. The, the point being, obviously, it's just the, the isolation is the issue and what impact it has on the mental health of the person. Um, we have people who would like to attend particular hearings in court but are not doing it because if they do, they end up in isolation again for 14 days when they get back into the facility. Um, so, um, you know, these, the impact of this virus is, it's more than just the medical impact. Um, and I, you know, I have concerns about the long-term impact, as I said before, on inmates and on uh, staff uh, who are who are trying to manage it? 
um, don't know how it's going to manifest itself. Um, but you know, we in Vermont, what is our mass? Our, I, I'm off the top of my head. I think we have a 48 hour disciplinary segregation. Um, that is the maximum when you, uh, um, without review, um, or there, you know, there's an initial review, but it's a 48 hour seg. And because we, we understand the damage that that can do. Um, and, uh, you know, the mental health side of this thing is huge. Um, you know, because we have people who are, you know, 14 day seg to prevent the virus from getting into facilities and spreading. Um, you know, it's, it's very concerning. Um, and I don't, I don't know the right answer. I don't know which is worse, um, the virus or the, the impact of keeping the virus out. But it's uh, um, definitely something that needs to be watched. And I, I know the commissioner and I have talked about this many times. So it's, there's no, no uh, uh, this isn't something new that I'm saying that he hasn't heard before. Is there enough testing? There, there is, Senator. You know, we test a facility a week. Um, St. Jasbury Northeast is being tested again today. This is the fifth week in a row mm -hmm. because we had introduction of the virus um, through um, staff members. Uh, we caught it, we, but the cont contact tracing, we and we'll, we'll be shortly moving to testing staff every two weeks. Um, we just the details out now. And then and the Joint Fiscal Committee just um, added, I think it was 8.5 million to testing. And right. part of that testing is supposed to be for corrections. So, you know, and again, this is part of this, you know, and I appreciate what Matt said about, you know, the, it's almost, it is almost like combat. And, and the post traumatic stuff, you know, we're trying, you know, we have, we have a clinician now that we brought on board and, we're putting a lot of emphasis onto that. And we're trying to work with vital core to provide the same level of support to the inmate population. But, you know, just imagine this week is the fifth week in a row that we tested St. Johnsbury because of that outbreak. And it wasn't an outbreak. I shouldn't say an outbreak. It was because of the exposure and the contact tracing. And we want to make sure that the facility is clean. So the staff has gone through five weeks in a row of being tested. That's, that in itself is stressful. And so we have we have plenty of testing. The testing is not an issue for us. We have a we have an emergency response team that responds with contact tracers, and we're training up another 14 contact tracers that are going to be used in the community uh, because um, as the numbers go up, the health department uh, is is in need of contact tracers. So if if an inmate went to court, they would have to come back and segregate for 14 days. Yeah, you know, these are the tough decisions we make. And at the end of the day, for me, I, I got to keep the facilities clean because if, mm -hmm. if, if we, if, you know, if we get an outbreak in either, especially either in, in Northern or Springfield where you have the older population, or excuse me, Northwest, um, where, you, where you have infirmaries, um, it could be disastrous. And I know it's, I, I hear what Matt's saying. I understand it try to do the best we can with it but on the balance something's got to give and, and i've got to keep the facilities clean other questions either matt or jim well i thank you both very much it's a really difficult subject um, and uh, clearly the the administration response through the Downs, Rackman, Martin report is um, quite, um, in my view, quite well done. Um, I'm glad that you're taking up the recommendations, but I, I hope that in the future we would take these medical conditions much more seriously. Um, that that's what we end up with. <clears throat> um, and that's the major change I think we'd all be looking for. This committee particularly is, um, I would say, is most concerned about this. this. And so many uh, events have occurred within the Department of Corrections. You know, um, 
And in fact, last December, they had the sexual assault charges, uh, or the uh, sexual uh, charges uh, against probation and parole officer, I believe, in Dallas Falls. Um, other things that have been going on that are really uh, trying, and uh, hopefully we make progress avoid this. I don't know if um, the next witnesses are available. Our next subject is the instruction report, in which Representative Emmons, I believe Al Cormier is going to be. The, the uh, Chief of Operations, Al Cormier, is going to cover this because I have another commitment. Well, Commissioner, we appreciate your being here. And, um, I get we've we're scheduled for 1230 with Jennifer Finch, yeah. Commissioner of Buildings and General Services, and Eric Wilcorn, Principal Assistant, Buildings and General Services. So they're not uh, here right now. I just emailed their admin and said we're ready for them. So I'm hoping they join it join momentarily. Well, why don't we just take a momentary break then <laughs> and uh, hopefully good. they'll be here by 1230. It's, 1225, according to my watch. Senator, Thanksgiving wishes to everybody on the committee. Yes, thank you, Jim. Okay.